So, Liang, let's uh, let's start the introduction okay, okay. of our okay, session. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> uh, first of all, welcome all of you join our session. Uh, let us start today discussion. Uh, the, the first uh, speak is Professor Maria Dulati. He will talk about the X-ray fundamental print of the platinum sample and the, the color lower and the sub-level IBC associated it with the gamma reports and the fundamental print in the feminine. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Liang. And I will tell you about the luminosity time correlation in X-rays and optical and the 3D fundamental plane in multi-wavelengths. We all know what are gamma ray bursts, but a brief reminder. So they are high energy flashes photon in the sky. Their typical duration is few seconds. And the important features of a well-sampled GRB light curve observed by burst alert telescope plus XRT that was uh, uh, indeed from the SWIFT mission launched in 2004, still ongoing. It is the peak of the prompt emission, then we have the decay phase, then majority of GRBs, uh, almost 50%, uh, almost they present a plateau emission, although not very well identified in majority of the cases. So we have 34% of cases in which the plateau emission is very well identified, then the end of the plateau emission and the afterglow emission. This case that I'm presenting here, it is the so-called gold sample uh, yeah, that I will- I don't see yes, this, right. I, I think you haven't shared your screen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for telling me because I... Uh, uh, so, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, now it's okay. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so... Uh, well, so um, gamma ray bursts are um, cosmologic, their cosmological origin has been accepted long ago in 1997. And I would like to revise again that the main properties of the, uh, of the uh, prompt and afterglow can be summarized in three main traits. So the peak of the prompt emission, the decay phase, the plateau emission, the uh, afterglow emission. And uh, um, I would like to mention that the uh, prompt emission ups, happens in, in a few seconds. Sometimes it can last uh, very long. And I will uh, tell you briefly about all classes. Then we have the X-ray optical and radio observation that can last uh, for days or even months after the main distinct event in prompt emission. The observed spectrum is non-thermal and GRB are very important for their energy emission mechanism. One important question is why are gamma ray bursts potential cosmological tools? For a series of reasons, because they can be probes of the early evolution of the universe, are observed beyond the epoch of ionization, allow us to investigate population three stars, allow us to track the star formation, and they are much more distant than supernovae 1A and quasars. But there is a huge drawback because GRBs don't seem to be standard candles with their isotropic prompt luminosities spanning over eight order of magnitudes. And um, uh, please uh, pay attention also to the talk of Via Nilsson that she will tell more about GRB cosmology. For 20 years, we have been struggling to try to answer this question how to standardize GRBs, how to use GRBs as standard candles. There is a huge challenge here. Light curves vary very widely. There is a common motto in the GRB community that says, if you have seen one gamma ray burst, you have just seen one. In fact, here we have the Swift light curves taken from the Swift repository that show great variability in their light curve. But there are good news because possible reliable candidates are the luminosity at the end of the plateau emission and its time duration and the peak luminosity in the prompt emission versus the luminosity at the end of the plateau emission. 
Here, I would like to point out that uh, if you would like to have a perfect standard candle, of course, you don't need to have any evolution of the variables that are involved in the standard candle. So it means in this specific case that luminosity and time should not evolve with redshift. So it means that the slope of the correlation should not change according to the redshift bins. That's why we divided the sample in several redshift bins, and we noted that the slope changes slightly, but not considerably, not more than two sigma. However, we wanted to apply a more robust statistical method, the Efron and Petrosian method, to remove any selection biases that can, can, that can come to play. And we uh, could then pinpoint that the true correlation as a slope of b equal to minus one, which means that the energy reservoir of the plateau is constant. And um, this is uh, the first in 2008 of a series of several papers um, in the later, later years. And we continued the investigation of correlations considering the luminosity at the end of the plateau emission versus the peak luminosity in the prompt emission. We repeated the same analysis, uh, dividing the sample in several redshift bins. And we discovered that the more luminous it is the prompt emission, the more luminous it is the plateau as well. So again, the correlation here, it is intrinsic to the GRB physics, and it is not due to selection biases. Now I would like to tell you a little bit more about the GRB zoo. Which class best works as standard candle? And I have bad and good news at the same time. Bad news is that none of these standard of these classes can be used as standard candles, but the good news are coming along the way. And I would like to summarize these uh, uh, classes of GRBs. So short GRBs have the T90 duration of the prompt emission less than two seconds, while long GRB uh, have T90 that it is greater than two seconds. And this is, this is the traditional classification. Then we have the short with extended emission uh, for which the duration is similar to long gamma ray bursts, but they are harder in the spectrum. And then we have the GRB associated with supernova 1BC for which the supernova has been really seen. And then in these um, long classes, the way uh, we built the correlation, we consider that the supernova is not, is not being seen. And then we have the ultra long gamma ray burst with the duration of the prompt greater than 2000 seconds. The X-ray flash is for which the X-ray fluence over the gamma ray fluence is greater than one. And then we have the type one and type two. Uh, classes that gathers basically the short and long classification. Type one are characterized by low star formation and no presence of the supernova and the natal kick. While the type two, uh, they are characterized by the supernova. They have high star formation. Uh, they, they are uh, born in high star forming region and they don't have a natal kick. This is according to Zhang et al. 2009. And here all these uh, classes, for example, the X-ray flashes were introduced first by Sakamoto et al. 2013. And here we have the um, other classes, uh, the traditional classification, Covelliot et al. 1993, Woosley et Bloom for the GRB supernova association and the short with extended emission by Norris and Bonnell 2006. An important point for uh, clustering or disentangling the different uh, cases and different classes of GRB is constituted by the GRB Supernova 1BC association and how this can, uh, can follow or not the luminosity time correlation. We can see from this, uh, from this plot the red triangles uh, pointing uh, upwards that they have a different slope than the long GRBs for which the supernova has not been seen. This, cor this slope is 2.8 sigma different uh, from the long uh, slope, from the slope of the, of the long GRBs with a probability of almost 5%. So we are on the verge saying that this is statistically different. And this means since the slope is minus 1.9, means that the plateau energy reservoir is not constant. The supernova GRB sample have been taken also from the sample of Cano et al. 2014. And the GRB supernova 1BC connection is an important problem. We are currently investigated with Moria-san and uh, uh, Tominaga-san that are also present uh, today. And uh, Moria-san will give a talk on Friday. So if you're interested in this, uh, um, in this uh, um, 
topic, uh, uh, you can definitely uh, attend his talk. And Tomi Nagasan in, uh, in, uh, in a couple of talks. So now I would like to give you the very nice news because uh, since we know that the luminosity, time correlation luminosity uh, at the end of the plateau emission versus the uh, time at the end of the plateau emission is intrinsic as well as the luminosity at the end of the plateau emission peak luminosity, it is intrinsic. And those two correlations have in common the luminosity at the end of the plateau emission, we can combine them in the 3D luminosity, peak luminosity time correlation. Here with the different color coded, we showed the different classes of GRB. And uh, we can see that the intrinsic scatter of this uh, plane is reduced of 24% compared to the 3D correlation. This correlation being the combination of two correlations that are both intrinsic to the GRB physics is also intrinsic. And uh, I promised you that I would tell you a little bit more about the gold sample. So the gold sample is characterized characterized by uh, features that are well represented, well sampled. So we have a flat plateau that it is uh, less than 41 degrees, and we have at, minimum, at least five points at the beginning of the plateau. So the correlation coefficient for the gold sample is 0 0.93 with a probability that it is 10 to the power of minus 16 and sigma intrinsic scatter of 0 0.27. We note that the closest GRBs to the plane belong indeed to the gold sample. We have a reduction of the intrinsic scatter of 54% compared to the 2D sample. Now one can ask this question, is that possible that we have a reduced scatter because we are reducing the sample? And we tried to answer this question uh, performing 10,000 Monte Carlo simulation showing the, that the probability of obtaining such a sigma scatter with the random 40 GRBs drawn from the 122 purely long gamma ray burst is only 0.3%. So it's much smaller than 5%. So definitely, this is not a selection of the sample. And uh, we can see the 3D correlation also as a proxy of the peak luminosity versus the energy reservoir of the plateau, because luminosity multiplied by time is, uh, uh, is a proxy of the energy reservoir of the plateau. So we can see that the uh, intrinsic scatter here, it is uh, slightly larger, but this correlation means that the prompt kinetic power is strongly correlated with the plateau energy for the gold sample. The more powerful the prompt emission, the more energy is released into the plateau phase. And now I would like to compare this correlation with the other three D correlation, the EPIC AI so and the energy of the plateau correlation as an intrinsic scatter of 031, Xu and Wang 2011 as uh, that relates luminosity, time, correlation with the EI, so the energy uh, in the prompt emission, the isotropic energy in the prompt emission, which yields a scatter of 0 0.43, as compared to the luminosity time correlation, of course, is an improvement because uh, the correspondent uh, to the relation is a scatter of 0 0.8 for the entire sample. But when we compare with the 3D fundamental plane relation, this relation has a, a scatter that it is uh, 36% smaller than luminosity time AI. So, and also the combo relation, which is the luminosity time relation, alpha is the temporal slope after the uh, plateau and peak in the new FMU spectrum as an intrinsic scatter, which is larger than uh, the previously mentioned correlations. So we can conclude that the luminosity time and peak correlation is an improvement upon previous results in the literature on the bidimensional correlation, as well as on the luminosity time AI, so the combo and the peak AI, so LATA correlations. We were excited about uh, this, uh, these results and we decided to continue further to investigate the relationship between the classes and the uh, 3D fundamental plane. Therefore, we measured the distances of the GRBs from the, uh, the short GRBs from the gold fundamental plane and all the other classes from the gold fundamental plane which is taken as a reference. And we discovered that among all classes, the short with extended emission and the uh, gold plane are statistically different. Now, what does it mean, this difference 
in terms of uh, energy emission mechanism, in terms of models. We can uh, think about uh, the possibility to explain the uh, plateau emission within the magnetar scenario. And if we consider the spin down luminosity of the magnetar, uh, that it is entirely beamed within the jet, we can see that the long gamma ray bursts are distinct, are a distinct class compared to the short GRBs and short with extended emission. And the um, mass accretion for this, uh, um, uh, that, that represents how the, uh, the the GRBs are, are displayed in this, uh, in this diagram shows that indeed all the, all the GRBs can be, um, can be explained within this scenario. Of course, we have uh, two outliers, the peculiar GRB 060614, uh, for which uh, we have been discussing, discussing a lot in the literature, whether or not should be considered a short with extended emission or uh, should be considered associated with supernovae. And then we have the other outlier here. Then uh, I would like to tell you that uh, this uh, work has been uh, built on previous uh, analysis done in the literature, Rovlinson, Rea, um, Bernardini, and Dallosso. And I would like also to point out that there are other possibilities uh, that we can use to explain the plateau emission. We can, we can use indeed the external shock model, and there will be a talk by Don Warren uh, on Friday about this. And we also investigated um, this problem with a student of mine, Gokul. We basically wanted to test the closure relationship between temporal and spectral indices and their connection to the fundamental plane. Therefore, we investigated the following closure relationship to understand if we can have ISM or wind medium in the regime or fast or slow cooling. And the most fulfilling relation pinpoints to wind slow cooling. But when we consider which one of this scenario could lead to the smallest scatter into the fundamental plane, we could find that uh, this is related to the fast cooling, either with, IS with ISM or wind medium, although the scatter is slightly larger compared to the uh, fundamental plane that uh, I'm going to tell you in a moment. And if you're interested for a more complete review, uh, I would suggest looking at a series of review papers that were then expanded and gathered in the Gamma Reverse Correlation book that I published in 2019 with the IOP eBooks collection. Now I would like to uh, conclude the first part of the talk saying that uh, we are going towards the standard candle. The 3D relation for the gold sample has an intrinsic scatter 54% smaller than the long gamma reverse for the correspondent bidimensional correlation. This implies that it is the tightest three-parameter correlation, including the plateau phase, and the statistical difference of the planes for short and long gamma reverse imply a difference in the magnetic field spin period diagram of the magnetar. This correlation also holds for Fermi GBM burst. Now, are you ready for the big news? I guess you are. And the fundamental plane for new classes of GRBs, we really ambushed the standard candle in its own nest. In fact, we decided to look further for a new class of GRBs, that it is a subset of the gold sample. The platinum sample, in fact, has the following features. So we should discard from the gold sample all gamma reverse that have, in, that have a large gap inside the data between the time start of the plateau and the time end. So then we will reduce the uncertainty. Then we also should remove the cases that have small plateau duration, less than 500 seconds with gaps after it. And this could mean that the plateau phase is longer than the one observed. Flares and bumps at the start and during of the plateau phase also must be removed. So with this cleaning up further of the light curves, we can reduce the scatter of 31%. And uh, if you want to know more about the, uh, uh, this uh, plane, I would suggest to uh, also listen to the talk of Alexander Leonard uh, in the next uh, session of today. And the fundamental plane still exists for, uh, for high energy gamma rays. So if we consider the uh, Fermi-LAT GRBs, 
a sample of the ones that, uh, that can be fitted with the broken power law, we could see that for three of them that have redshift, we could observe out of the 16 that have redshift and have the broken, uh, broken power law fit up to from 2008 until uh, 2016, we could see that three of them present plateau. And this plateau at high energy follow the 3D um, uh, fundamental plane. Now, if we consider the uh, histogram, the differential distribution of the time at the end of the plateau emission, we can see that the GRBs observed by LAT, by Fermi LAT, have a smaller time compared to the other. But we cannot have a one to one comparison because essentially this is uh, um, impossible uh, because we don't have contemporaneous observation at the same time for these GRBs. Now we can say more about extending the luminosity time correlation in optical. And we discovered the luminosity time correlation for more than 100 gamma ray bursts. This is a, a work that was initiated by Li Liang, who is part also of this, uh, of this effort, and many other uh, scientists uh, worldwide. So we could see that the gold sample definition works also for the optical sample. So we have the optical data and the X-ray data colored differently in uh, red and blue, respectively. Here we have the luminosity time correlation for optical, and the gold sample is pinpointed by these red points. So again, the gold sample is defined exactly as it was defined in X-ray, and it allows for a reduction of scatter of 52.4%. So for all GRBs, the slope of the correlation is minus 1, and uh, sigma is 0. Point, sigma square is 0 0.65 for the gold sample is uh, sigma square is more than half of it so the slope is still, still compatible the slope of minus 1 is still compatible in one sigma so it means that the energy reservoir of the plateau stays constant in this correlation in optical luminosity too and if we compare the x-ray and the optical observations uh, for which we have contemporaneous observation of the plateau emission in X-ray in the optical, and this happens for 56 swift gamma reverse, and we run the t-test, we could see that this distribution are similar. If we consider then the GRB supernova ABC class, where with A, we indicate strong spectroscopic evidence of the supernova, with B, clear light curve bump, as well as some spectroscopic evidence resembling the supernova, and a clear bump in the C category consistent with other GRB supernova at the spectroscopic redshift of the GRB, we can see that this correlation also holds at the same level of the others and with the same intrinsic slope. If instead we want to check what it is the dependence of this correlation from the class or from the uh, class uh, segregated in uh, short uh, GRB supernova, long X-ray flashes, ultra long and X-ray rich, or we segregate in the classes of type one of type two, or we consider the time duration in the rest frame of the prompt emission or the steepness of the plateau, we can clearly see that there is no particular trend. And here it is the summary of the um, uh, slopes of the correlation for the several classes. We can note definitely that the gold sample is uh, the ones that have the smallest uh, scatter, the, and it is followed by the short GRBs and short with extended emission. Of course, we want to increase the sample, and we are looking for more data and to uh, uh, confirm or not this, uh, these results. Now, working in progress, which GRBs will be chosen as a good rice grain? It's like we are working in, this, in the field. And the good news is that uh, we are extending now the 2D relation with the 3D optical correlation that for the moment exists for 47 gamma ray burst. So I would like just to show you the uh, very young students from the Scientific Caribbean Foundation from Puerto Rico that I'm mentoring uh, since uh, last, uh, last summer. And Samuel Young is a, a Sully student. I'm also mentoring him. And for detail about the 3D optical relation, uh, please uh, see talk in uh, the next session. Here with this color coded, we indicated the several, several classes of 
gamma ray burst. And now I would like to tell you about the importance of the Subaru telescope, which is hosted uh, and it is uh, um, run by NOJ and hosted in Hawaii for the current study. In some cases, uh, we had to discard GRBs because of the power law behavior, because they had too few points or because they had poor error bar determination or lack of spectral information, which is relevant for the closure relationship and relevant to determine the luminosity. Out of these 267 GRBs that we have analyzed, and here we would like to present the case of 010222 that we refitted with our uh, uh, phenomenological uh, model, actually the willing tal 2007 uh, model, and we can see that the uh, points, the data points of Subaru, they are very critical and crucial because in this case, they are exactly at the end of the plateau emission, so they allow to recover this GRB. Are you ready now for the fantastic news? The journey with the KISO telescope has started. We will leverage this network collaboration with COPI of DOTI. Mission as start is, is ongoing and Alan will be the next speaker of the session. So we have NOJ with uh, several scientists and then we have students from Jagiellonian University, some hosts from London, uh, David Alexander Kahn from Spain and uh, Brad Senko, the PI of the SWIFT mission from NASA and Alan and his team from, uh, from DOTI, and we are trying to involve, so, involve also the Fermi team. Now the question is that what could we observe with the Keys Observatory? So if we base our computation on 20 years of observation from SWIFT, Fermi, and the Interplanetary Network, we can observe 229 GRBs for each year. So it means 22 GRBs, eight with plateaus, that can be observed by KISO. And the good news is that if we can integrate the observation over 1,000 seconds, we will have a sufficient limiting magnitude to observe almost all gamma ray bursts according to our preliminary analysis. And now I would like to uh, present more in details the science team and uh, the software developers. Uh, so uh, um, Moria San is, uh, is uh, now present and they will give a talk on Friday as well as uh, Tomi Nagasama, Nino San from University. University of Tokyo, Alan will give a talk uh, uh, next, and uh, Khan from Spain, uh, Sam, me, the student, and, uh, and Brad Senko from, from NASA. And now I also want to give me just one second to advertise the fact that I would like to build a group at NUJ, so I will provide strategic mentory one-to-one -one weekly meeting, so if students would like to, um, to join, uh, I will integrate also with activities with NUJ, invite a student to attend the Supernova group, and we, um, I invite and encourage if students are, uh, or postdoc or PhD are interested to apply, we have also opened the, uh, the uh, PhD admission at Sokendai University. University, and you can apply through the following uh, funding scheme. Thank you very much for your attention, and you are all invited to join if you're interested to the KISO optical follow-up observation. If you're interested, please contact me. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Professor. Maria Duat gave us uh, this is excellent uh, talks. Uh, Thank you. If any questions, Okay, so I have a question. So I don't understand uh, what uh, do you defend the um, when you when you talk about a flight uh, flight plateau? When, how do you defend the degree? You mean you said you said many times the plateau the degree less than forty one one percent. How 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 do you defend this degree? Yes, so basically, if you consider the distribution of, of the plateau emission, the distribution gives a uh, Gaussian, and the, uh, after 41 degrees, you start to have the tail of the Gaussian. I don't know if I have a, a plot here, but oh, I can, uh, oh, I can okay. show you. So this is the, this oh, is, uh, yes, let okay. me see if I, yes, so this is the this, main. Uh, this is the main this degree from the Gauss fitting. Yes, okay, so this is the slide. Oh. So 
if you consider the um, all the fit within the Willing et al. 2007 model, then you can see that this is the distribution of the old gangle. And if you want to fit with a Gaussian, essentially mm -hmm. you would have to cut at 41 but of okay. course with uh, this uh, this classification is a morphological classification and uh, i would like to also to cite your paper in 2018 in which you were uh, considering <laughs> the distinction the distinction between uh, between a magnetar and non-magnetar event and uh, uh, you were considering uh, uh, isotropic emission uh, while yes. in the while in the case that we are considering uh, in the paper of strat et al 2018 we are considering the jetted emission and this uh, as we discussed with Liang several times uh, mm, uh, led us to different results so it is important also to consider how the morphology of the light course can be indeed uh, um, connected with the, uh, the physical interpretation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay, thank you. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Your speaker, okay. Um, okay, the next speak is Professor Alan Washington, is right? Uh, uh, he will talk about the search for the famous short gamma burst with D dot. Dotting and the uh, Tomo E goes in. Okay, well, okay. You are muted, Alan. Alan, you are muted. Thank you. Dotty <laughs> Dot is called Dotty. The to do the, these are pronounced as one. I have no idea how Tomo E goes and is pronounced either. So, um, hopefully, perhaps it's somebody can tell me something. Sorry. The pronunciation is Tomoe Gozen. Tomoe Gozen. Okay, I will try to do my best. Okay, so um, let me talk about a couple of projects we have for looking for um, short gamma ray bursts detected by Fermi and then localized with these two telescopes. Um, whoops, how do I go back? There we go. Um, in Doty, I have, well, I have a bunch of collaborators in both these projects. In Doty, it's mainly people at the UNAM. Um, also, uh, Matt Butler at uh, Arizona State University, um, and then people at Maryland. My co-PI on Doty is William Lee at the UNAM, um, who I've been working with for about 12 years. And then the new project is um, working with Maria. She's the PI of this project on the Kiso Schmidt and the Dongwei Gosen camera. So I probably don't have to give this slide here, but I like doing it anyway. Um, why are binary neutron stars and neutron star mergers interesting? As a physicist, I think they're interesting laboratories for physics at high energies and high densities. Um, in terms of the evolution of the universe, they're probably, well, possibly, probably important sites for the production of very heavy elements. And I think they're just fascinating objects. I mean, I think, I, you know, it'd be really nice to know what are the compact projects, uh, products of, of, of binary neutron star mergers. Are they magnetars or do they go straight to a black hole? Or, or, or both, and I know what, what circumstances do you get a magnetar and what, what circumstances a black hole? What are the properties of Kilanova as, as a population? We've seen one, okay. Um, so let's, let's now see the, the population. What are the distribution of the masses and the velocities of the ejector? What the, the um, balance between the wind and the dynamical components? Are they powered exclusively by radioactive decay or are they also powered by the magnetar spin down? And finally, do neutron star black holes, which we now know exist, um, do those mergers produce electromagnetic counterparts or are the mass ratios and spins of the population such that you know, the neutron star gets swallowed whole. Um, we don't have a lot of data. Um, we have one event for which we have both gravitational wave and electromagnetic data. Then we have a handful for which we have gravitational wave data only, okay? We have between one to three other binary neutron stars detected in O3. 
and we've got somewhere between two and four neutron star black hole mergers detected in O3. There's the two recently announced ones that are, are fairly certain. Then there is 1904-26, which is pretty marginal as a detection. And then there's 1908-14, which is interesting, but possibly marginal as a neutron star event. And then we have lots of electromagnetic events, okay? We have about 500 uh, Fermi short GRBs, and that's growing about 45 a year. We have about 100, and, we, sorry, we have 30, 150 Swift GRBs, and they're, they're growing about 10 a year. But of those, only about 36 have sufficient optical observations from the ground um, to get a redshift or something you believe for a redshift. And only four of them have deep enough observations at a late enough time that you'd, if you feel somewhat comfortable saying something about a detection or a constraint on the kilonova. So, you know, I think it's up to us observers to improve this and, you know, get more observations and um, better constraints on, on these events. There's a chain from detection to follow up, okay? Detection happens in either gravitational waves or electromagnetic, um, in the case of GRBs. Um, after the merger, of course, there's no more gravitational waves. So after the merger, everything is done in, in light, okay? So the first thing you need is a localization to about one arc second. You then need a confirmation of the optical brightness. And with those two, you can then go with big telescopes and do deep photometry for the kilonova or try and get a redshift. And there's three detection options, okay? There's you know, gravitational waves, the Swift GRBs, and there's Fermi GRBs. So gravitational events, they have uncertainties of hundreds to thousands of square degrees. So the localizations are using wide field optical telescopes and the gamma ray satellites. This is, you know, this is great stuff. Everybody that wants to do this, um, but it's on hold at the moment until 04 starts again, which will be next summer at the earliest. It's also very difficult. Um, there were no EM detections in 03, uh, despite having set somewhere between three and seven sources. And so, so far we're, you know, we've got one detection out of eight possible events. But I mean, I think this would be the jackpot if we could, you know, regularly detect binary neutron star mergers with gravitational wave data as well, the data set would be extremely rich. And then the SWIFT short GRBs. Um, that gives you a very good localization of three out minutes. As the spacecraft slews automatically to observe with XRT and UVOT. Um, you get positions to one or two arc seconds most of the time, you know, 90% of the time. They are distributed rapidly and widely using GCN notices. You get confirmations of the optical brightnesses with 50 centimeter, two meter telescopes. So this is a mature process. It's widely exploited in the community. Um, there's about 10 events a year. Uh, not all are detected and followed up optically. So maybe five, you know, maybe we're adding this at about five a year in terms of the, the well-observed ones. And then finally, there are Fermi short GRBs. Again, the uncertainties from GVM detections are very similar to those from gravitational wave detections. They're 100 to 2,000 square degrees. You need wide field optical images um, to localize the candidate counterparts. And this process is not being widely exploited in the community. Um, and it, there's a great potential here, I think. Fermi detects about 45 short January bursts a year. So, you know, that's four and a half times as many as Swift. So there's a potential here to significantly increase our access to short GRBs for, for deep follow-up. This was powered by Leo Singer in his thesis with uh, IPTF. Um, IPTF in those days had a seven square degree imager on a 1.2 meter telescope. Um, and he detected eight out of 35 Fermi GRBs, but I don't think any of them were short. So inspired by this, um, we came up with, with DOTI, the Decker Degree Optical Transients Imager. This is um, installed at the Observatory Astronomico Nacional in Baja California in Mexico. This is one of the best three sites in the world for astronomy. Um, it's dark, it's almost 3000 meters. 
has excellent climate. We observe 80% of the nights. It also has very good seeing, but we have two arc second pixels in Doty, so it, it doesn't matter to us. It's located in a, 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 an area in a national park that's dedicated to, to astronomy. So that's protecting us from local development. And then the state, uh, it's a desert state with very little water. So that's projecting us from regional development. So I think it will stay dark for quite a while. This is the basic element of Doty. Okay, it's largely commercial components. We, we take a Celestron, um, 11 inch, 28 centimeter, very fast prime focused imager. We couple that with um, an FLI um, uh, CCD imager. Uh, we, the, the, the CCD is actually 8K by 6K, but we only use a 6K by 6K section because of vignetting. And a six micron pixels, so we get two arc second pixels on the sky. Read noise is fine for broadband imaging. Read time is very fast. The one downside is the front illuminated devices, so we only have a peak quantum efficiency of about 60%. We need a focuser, so we use a commercial focuser. Here we had a lot of problems with robustness. So we basically rebuilt the mechanical coupling to the telescope and that has improved them enormously. And we have um, in-house uh, tilt adapters so that we can tilt the CCD to align the CCD with the focal plane of the telescope. Most of these are commercial components and one of these will set you back about $21,000. So Doddy is relatively cheap. Um, one of these will give you a field of view of about 3.4 deg uh, degrees. So here's an image of M31, um, M32, NGC 205. It's a 36 megapixel image, 3.4 degrees. It's nice, but it's not big enough. So we put six of these on the same mount, pointing you know, slightly differently in the sky to give us more coverage. Um, here you can see, let me, whoops, let me turn on the laser pointer. So these are the CCDs, okay? This here is the mechanical tilt adapter. These are the detectors and the focus at the back end. You can't see them here. Turned on now. So this is what you get with six of these. Um, you get a field of view of seven degrees by 10 degrees and a 200 megapixel image. So, um, Field is great, but we need sensitivity as well. Uh, we get to somewhere between an AB magnitude of 18 and a half and 20 and a half and a thousand seconds. That's a 10 sigma magnitude. 10 sigma is appropriate for this because you've got a lot of independent elements there. Um, GRBs fade very rapidly. The median magnitude of a long GRB at a thousand seconds is about 19 and a half, which is in the middle of our range. Short GRBs are probably fainter. Um, so we need to observe short GRBs immediately. We can't wait three hours, four hours, six hours and see the GRB fade by two or three magnitudes. It will just be below our sensitivity. So what do we expect? Um, there are 45 Fermi short GRBs each year. I had my student, uh, Ocelot Lopez, look at the historical archive of Fermi GRBs and see if Doddy had been operating since Fermi was launched, what fraction could it have observed? And we designed, defined observed as the, the GRB being um, above a, an air mass of, of 3.2 and, and, and being in astronomical twilight or, or at night. And 18% can be observed uh, immediately. And then we have 80% of good nights. So that means that we can observe six Fermi SGRBs per year immediately, plus another few after an hour or so. Now, not all of these will be detected, but if we can detect them with a 28 centimeter telescope, they're gonna be very suitable for follow-up with larger telescopes. Um, having got candidates with DOTI, we follow them up with our other robotic telescopes at, at the Observatorio Astronomico Nacional. RATIR is a 1.5 meter. Quietly is a 50 centimeter and Colibri is a new 1.3 meter that we'll install next year. And then we do follow up on the confirmed candidates with Keck and Gemini that we have access to through our US collaborators and with GTC in which Mexico is a partner. Now six a year is not great. You know, it would like to, nice to be 45 a year. But the thing is, 
um, other sites could have similar rates. And we have partial funding for a second site, for a second DOTI at the Observatoire de Provence in France. I'd also comment that other similar telescopes like GoTo, like Atlas could do the same thing, okay? Um, and we wouldn't be in competition in the sense that um, if you're in a different part of the world, you look at different GRBs immediately. So there's, there's a lot of potential here for collaboration. So Dodi to date, we, we commissioned about two years ago in March, 2019 with all six telescopes. Then during 03, our priorities were uh, gravitational wave events. We observed a lot of, of those. Our paper has just been submitted. Um, we didn't detect anybody, anything, nobody detected anything. Um, but nevertheless, during 03, uh, we did observe some Fermi GRBs and we detected one, I'll show you that in a minute. And then we were closed, our observatory uh, is very difficult to operate um, because people, it's, it's very remote. And so people are in very close contact. And so it was very difficult operating COVID. And we were essentially closed for a year. And then we opened again in March. Um, and our priority since March has been Fermi short GRBs. We have observed 37 GRBs um, from Swift and Fermi. We have four afterglow detections. All of those were Swift long GRBs. We had one Fermi short GRB that we could observe immediately, but we had a software failure. That was my fault. Um, we have software that updates the position as it comes in. And I've been working on that code and the part that updated the position worked perfectly, but I commented out the part that actually acted on that information. So we kept observing the old position all night. So this is our detection from 03, okay, 191001A. That was the Fermi detection. So you can see you're looking at a, an error region here of about 15 degrees by 15 degrees. Um, we had an automatic response. We, we just took one field. Um, we only observed for 500 seconds, but we were on it very quickly. We were on it between six and 18 minutes. After that, Dottie moved to continue observing a geo, uh, gravitational wave source. And our limiting magnitude here was, you know, at the bright end, it was at 18.6, uh, um, 10 sigma. And this is what we detected. We detected this source here, which is not present in pan stars. And we saw it fade from 16.7 to 17. There was an almost simultaneous detection serendipitously by Atlas. Um, there's no counterpart in the WISE catalog. So this is probably not a flaring M dwarf and we would suggest this is the afterglow. So we were very happy about this. This just demonstrates that, you know, Dalti can work. And then we have a, a new project um, in the Kisa Schmidt telescope with the Tomoe Golsin camera. Um, the Kisa Schmidt, is, well, Kisa Observatory is, um, is run, is owned and run by the Institute of Astronomy of the University of Tokyo. It's a one meter aperture telescope, it's robotic, and it's separated by you know, 108 degrees in longitude from Doty. So, you know, the GLBs that we observe immediately with Doty are very different to ones that are observed in Japan. The weather is not as good as Doty, um, but the aperture and their imager make it a much more powerful combination. And the imager is quite something. Um, this is the, the prime focus imager. It's 84 CMOS devices, each 2K by 1K. Um, so it's about a 200 megapixel device. It covers 20 square degrees. It's, it's sparsely filled, so you need to do sort of four pointings to get complete coverage. The, because it's CMOS, the readout is very fast. Their slow readout rate is two hertz. Um, and this is, this is quite an amazing camera. So the, the collaboration is being led by Maria and the local coordinator at Tokyo is Yunino. We started earlier this year. The combination of you know, a one meter telescope with this amazing imager is much more sensitive than Delsi. Um, so I think we can probably go you know, to, to look for short GRBs that are you know, a few hours old. 
let's say three hours, that gets us 36% of Fermi GRBs. Let's say the weather's 60%. So that gives about 10 Fermi short GRBs a year, and I think a very good detection probability. The status of this project is we have developed an interface to robotic scheduling system, so we can, at the moment, program observations. We're working now on getting rapid access to the supernova transients pipeline. They have a, a nice supernova um, pipeline, but it, it doesn't run as fast as we need it to run. We need, um, for example, you know, when we observe a short GIB, we'd like to know that the detections are there within an hour so that I can program follow-up observations with GTC. Um, and so that's, that's the stage we're at at the moment. So to, to summarize, I think short GRBs are an alternative means to investigate binary neutron stars and neutron star black hole mergers. Um, we're aiming to localize short GRBs detected by Fermi with a view to carrying out deep follow-up with eight to 10 meter telescopes. Dottie is working now and, you know, our priority at the moment is Fermi short GRBs. And we're working on, um, getting a similar sort of program working at the Kiesel Schmidt and the Tomoe Gosen imager. Um, well, thank you very much. And I'd be happy to try to answer questions. Well, thank you so much, Alan, for, uh, for this very nice talk. Um, and uh, um, are there questions from the audience? Okay, if not, maybe I'll ask a question. So we did a combined effort uh, between, uh, between Doty and the KISO. So then the total number of GRBs expected would be like uh, um, around uh, 20 GRBs, yes? Yes, let's say we, we, let's say we can observe six at, at Doty and you know, you can observe 10 at KISO, that's right, getting so. us to 16. You then have to multiply that by the success rate. You're not gonna see every GRB, um, but you could easily be getting say 10 a year, you know, detecting 10 a year. So that would be very significant compared to the, the SWIFT rate. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you for uh, uh, pointing out this. Yeah, and I just want to say that uh, since, uh, as, as Alan mentioned, the code is uh, finished, uh, we are testing it. And uh, as soon as uh, KISO will be uh, uh, operational again, because now it's uh, the rainy season, so it's in the maintenance, then we are going to start the observation as soon as possible. All right. Yes, yes, please, uh, please, uh, Tomina Gassam, so, if, you, if you have a question. Yeah, so I would like to ask on the DOTI. So are you uh, performing the uh, image subtraction to detect the transient? Is it right. At the, um, in 03, we just did comparison to catalogs. We're currently doing um, implementing uh, image subtraction. We're doing reference images and, well, let me rephrase that. In 03, we did some image subtraction, with, but with images taken after the event. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we're now doing reference images of the entire sky, and we're implementing routine image subtraction to, you know, improve our ability to work, say, around galaxies, which was a bit of a problem in 03. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we do use uh, uh, different image taken by uh, Dopey itself. Yes, the reference images are taken by Totten. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, again, and thank you, uh, Tomina Gasama, for the question. And let's move to uh, the next speaker. So the next speaker of the session is uh, uh, Tomina Gasama. Uh, so please share the screen. Yes, and uh, uh, he will tell us about uh, follow-up observations of transients with optical telescopes. Uh, so please, you can start. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to talk about the uh, observation of the transient with optical telescope. So I'm Tomina from uh, LMOJ in Japan. So 
already uh, Aram uh, made a good uh, introduction, but uh, I would I would uh, very uh, start uh, the reason why uh, collapse are needed. So uh, the some uh, transient, as I mean, uh, some discoveries uh, like the uh, gravitational wave have uh, 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 quite wide uh, localization area like this. So it is difficult to uh, identify the location transient only with the uh, observation of uh, gravitational wave signal. So uh, in order to uh, do a further study, uh, we need to identify the location of transient. And uh, the other one is uh, uh, the understanding of the, uh, the nature and origin of transient. So this is a, an example of uh, general observation. As you can see, the, uh, it changes uh, the color and uh, it fades quite rapidly like this. And uh, uh, um, importantly, uh, we cannot deobserve the same transient after it fades. So it is important to uh, collect information during its bright enough uh, using the uh, much wavelengths and much uh, mixing the instrument as various as possible. So uh, today, uh, I would like to talk about the uh, 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 observation with hyper-shippling curve, which uh, uh, has a, a field of view of 1.8 square degree. It's put on the uh, telescope with 8.2 meter of diameter. So it can cover uh, M31 in, in one shot, so like this. The uh, 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 capability of uh, optical telescope and uh, optical instrument is uh, measured with the etanju, which is a product of uh, light collecting area and field of view. So as you can see, uh, the uh, HST is the uh, uh, best uh, so far. And, uh, so uh, in the uh, time domain astronomy, the uh, uh, light collecting power uh, per unit time is quite important to reach uh, uh, enough depth uh, to detect uh, uh, faint transients. So the HST is uh, quite powerful, I'd say. And uh, today, uh, I will introduce two type of transient gravitational wave signal and the first radio burst, uh, which is followed with uh, hyperscope income. So it's a bit old, but uh, it, uh, this observation uh, illustrates uh, uh, observational challenges in such a deep uh, polar observation. So this is a Kinova uh, 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 called called GW70 or 70 you, you may know, I think. So this uh, white region is a, a probability region of this uh, gravitational wave signal. Uh, due to this uh, gravitational wave was uh, observed with uh, three instruments. Uh, I mean, uh, two LIGO and one Virgo, so the area is uh, much narrower than other gravitational wave sources. However, uh, the area is quite wide compared to the field of view of optical telescope. Each circle shows a uh, field of view of hypersurfing cam. So uh, the uh, field of view of hypersurfing cam is wide in optical instrument. However, it is much narrower than the uh, probability area of a gravitational wave. So uh, such is a tiring observation like this is needed. In this case, uh, we follow the uh, 24 square degree, uh, which is, is corresponding to the 57% of probability region uh, of GW17 or 17. With this observation, uh, unfortunately, it's 
it can be observed during the twilight uh, from the uh, uh, Hawaii. So the limiting magnitude is quite shallow. Uh, the, uh, this is a uh, limiting magnitude in, in Z band. So 20 past magnitude. And uh, we observed uh, the same region uh, twice. Then we found uh, 1,500 uh, variable sources. So it's too much. So we need to screen them. Uh, so we adopted uh, several conditions. For, for example, uh, it should be positive in the uh, observation in the image after the um, merger. And uh, it uh, should be associated with, uh, uh, should not be associated with uh, non-extending source, uh, which is, which are probably uh, stars. And uh, uh, the uh, location of the transient in the, uh, uh, host galaxy or uh, 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 so, I mean uh, the location of uh, transient in the host galaxy is also important and the, uh, the most important thing is the uh, distance information unfortunately uh, most of the uh, uh, host, uh, host galaxy of uh, possible candidate uh, doesn't have uh, uh, the information of distance. However, uh, uh, a part of them can be excluded, uh, which is uh, located outside the uh, uh, 3D sky map, uh, de derived from the gravitational web source, uh, gravitational observation. The, uh, there are one object which uh, is uh, uh, firmly located inside the 3D sky map. The name is JGM 70 BTC. Uh, but uh, there are other uh, uh, 59 object, nine, nine object uh, uh, without uh, uh, information of uh, distance of a post reality. So in order to constrain the uh, distance, we, we uh, calculate the possibility that the uh, Post galaxy is located in the uh, 3D sky map, uh, assuming the luminosity function with like galaxies. And uh, this uh, value P3D is uh, significantly small for distant galaxies. So, uh, for example, uh, adopting this parameter uh, or uh, this value, uh, the P3D of uh, JM70 BTC is 64%. Six, uh, while the other uh, the, the value of other candidates are quite small, less than one percent. So we can conclude that this uh, JGM seventy BTC is a, a unique uh, candidate of the uh, optical counterpart of this uh, gravitational wave sources. So, so uh, and th this one is uh, quite famous for uh, uh, named as AT. In 70, 2070 GFO. So uh, with this observation, we found uh, eight, about 80, 85 astronomic, astronomical variable objects in 24 square degrees. So it means uh, there are 3.6 variable objects per square degree in the image with limiting magnitude of 20 past. 21st. So to uh, uh, identify the uh, counterpart, uh, the distance information is quite useful. Then uh, I move to uh, the uh, uh, first radio burst. Uh, this uh, FRB 15, 20, 12, 30, 30 was uh, detected by PAC. So these uh, green circles are the beam of uh, PACs. And, uh, uh, as it, and uh, that this FRB is detected in this beam. So as you can see, the uh, field of view of HSC is quite much wider than uh, uh, 
uh, one beam of arc. So uh, we can uh, perform a deep observation in three bands. Uh, so G, we adopted the GRI band. And this is a, a three color image of this region. And this green circle is uh, the uh, uh, with this of uh, one beam of Pax telescope. And uh, this uh, figure showing the uh, 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 light curve of uh, several transient like GRB and supernovae. And uh, uh, these points correspond to the uh, uh, limiting magnitude observation at, uh, as a function of the time after event. Our, our observation puts uh, uh, the parameter around here, so uh, deepest follow up to date, I'd say. And uh, uh, this is a, 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 a uh, diagram uh, to uh, identify the astronomical variable sources. So uh, the uh, observation area is quite na narrow compared to the gravitational wave cases, but uh, uh, the, thanks to such a narrow region, uh, we can go quite deep, 26 magnitude. And we observe uh, the same field three epoch, over three epochs, and then we, can, we did identify uh, 120 variable sources, and we test the detection with an uh, alternative uh, image subtraction method. And uh, to uh, be sure uh, the object is uh, a real transient. And then we did the visual inspection and we found 13 objects. And uh, in this case, we have uh, uh, three colors and three epochs. So we did the uh, temporary fitting uh, of a light curve with the uh, uh, supernova template. And uh, this, uh, only three objects can be fitted with uh, supernovae and uh, the uh, uh, fitted ones are uh, it's uh, identified as a corporal of supernova, and there are no pipeline supernova. So, uh, uh, using this uh, 13 uh, variable object in 0.2 square degrees in uh, 65 variable object per square degree in image with the limiting magnitude of 26.5. So, this is a uh, 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 comparison of uh, uh, our upper limit with the uh, uh, difference magnitude of type As you can see, our uh, upper limit uh, excludes the type and supernovae uh, associated, uh, the, the association of type and supernovae uh, up to Z equal 0.6. And uh, the uh, real shift of this FRB can be, can also can be also uh, constrained from the dispersion measure of FRB. So uh, the, these lim uh, both limits are quite close. So uh, the as association uh, with a type of supernova is mostly excluded with this observation. So uh, uh, this is a, a, a summary of the observational challenges. So the um, most important thing is uh, the uh, ex exclusion of uh, contaminations. Uh, in the GW case, uh, the time variability and color uh, information are uh, reduce the number of candidates. And also the, uh, the most important thing is the distance information. For FRB case, uh, the multicolor light curve and uh, Automatic ray shift of host galaxy uh, is uh, are important, and uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, ray shift constraint uh, from the opt optical and radio observations uh, uh, restricts the uh, association with type of 
So this is the summary of my talk. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, very nice talk. And now I would like to uh, open up for uh, questions or uh, comments that you have on, uh, on this talk. So you can just uh, uh, use the rise up. Okay, so Alan, a question from Alan, please, Alan. Yeah, I, I so so. What do you use for your references? Do you have an all sky image as well with um, HSC? Mm, no, unfortunately, no. So for the GW case, the uh, I would say fortunately our uh, depth is quite shallow, so we use a reference image of uh, as I mean we use a pan stars image as a reference. Uh -huh. For uh, FRB case, it is quite deep. So we observed uh, the same field three epochs. So the last one, we take, take the last one as a reference. OK, yeah. thank you. OK, thank you very much. And there is another question from uh, Biagio. Yes, thank you very much, Tominaga-sama, for your interesting talk. Uh, it's just a curiosity. Um, I would like to know. The response of the system, I mean, the Subaru telescope, once it receives the alert, how much time does it require to align to the source if visible in that time? Thank you. Mm, so, the, uh, unfortunately, the Subaru telescope is not automated. So, to trigger TOO, we need to call uh, the director. However, the uh, earlier case, we uh, start the observation 1.7 hours after the alert. Uh, from the LIGO. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And now uh, we thank again uh, Tomika Nagasama and we move on on the next speaker of the session, mm -hmm. uh, Demos, uh, Demos Tene Kazanas. Uh, I would like to thank you for staying up so late to give well, this talk uh, today. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> I and can yes, please get the, uh, the correct uh, screen up. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you. Mm, let me. Do you see it? Do you see my screen? Uh, no, not yet. Unfortunately, yeah. we can't. We can't see it yet. Well, I clicked on the. Uh, I clicked on the. Uh, you, there is this bottom down, uh, it's a share screen. You click on it and you share desktop and then you, you will be able to, to share the screen. Okay, uh, now maybe? Uh, oh, not yet. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you have to click. Share there also. Yes, yes, yes. Now we can we can ah, start seeing okay, yes. <laughs> and the uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, will will tell us about relativistic proton instability yes, so, and the prompt to after plateau luminosity ratio. Thank you. Well, after all these uh, nice uh, observational talks, actually, uh, uh, I think this work might be related to your work, uh, Maria. Uh, so. Uh, yes. Uh, this work is related to observations, as we will see at the end. However, before we get there, I have to give you some of the uh, some background on the uh, theory be behind that. And this is a theory about the prompt emission of the GRB. Oh, I can see us up there. Uh, so uh, this theory, it's almost 20 years old by now, but uh, not people pay much attention. The only thing is, the point is that it has uh, some features which you may find interesting, uh, as I will explain to you. So we have now the, uh, after all these years, after many thousands of GRBs, the uh, prompt emission is still unknown. So uh, uh, let me explain to you what my view is on that. Uh, so we all agree that, that's something we all agree. There is a relativistic outflow, a relativistic blast wave that basically expands and sweeps the material that's the circumburst material. Uh, we all understand very well that most of the uh, protons in the, behind the forward shock are relativistic and they move relativistically with Lorentz factor gamma. So uh, of course, the uh, shock sweeps also electrons, but the electrons have a 
this is an inertial uh, piston. So the electrons have energies which are 2,000 times smaller than the protons. And if we rely on those electrons to produce the radiation, they're very inefficient. So the big issue has been how to convert the energy from, which is on the protons, Lorentz uh, of energy per proton, uh, MPC squared times gamma, gamma is the Lorentz factor of the uh, blast wave, uh, into electrons. So usually this is assumed. And therefore, uh, by putting by fiat the electron distribution uh, that you have, then essentially you get by fiat whatever you really want to see. Uh, what I'll describe here is a uh, uh, different procedure that process actually, uh, which involves some physical reasoning behind the conversion of the proton energy into electron positron pairs. And this is a relativistic proton instability. We know, we learned at school that we cannot pack too much uranium or plutonium because we get a critical mass and then the whole thing explodes. Well, the situation is very similar here. Uh, so we have now the uh, blast wave that sweeps material. And as it sweeps, it gets more and more and more relativistic protons behind the forward shock. Uh, here the issue, I have to remind you that what we call critical mass, it was not really critical mass, it was critical column density, because the idea is that before a neutron from a decay escapes, it hits a, uranium, a plutonium or a uranium nucleus and produces more neutrons. And if each of those before it escapes produces, uh, collides with another New, uh, nucleus it produces even more and we have a, an exponential increase in the number of neutrons and exponential decrease in the uh, uh, in the number of uh, uh, nuclei which convert energy into uh, radiation. So we have a similar situation here. We basically have a relativistic blast wave which keeps piling up relativistic protons behind it. And uh, uh, we also have <clears throat> electrons that produce synchrotron radiation. And the point is that if an electron, if a photon from an electron before it escapes hits a uh, relativistic proton to produce another electro positron pair, then we have a similar situation where the whole thing may cascade and we have an efficient conversion of the proton energy into, uh, into radiation. So uh, the question here is how many uh, so all the particles have more or less energy, which is the rest mass times gamma, which gamma is the blast wave uh, uh, Lorentz factor. So how many photons does a, uh, 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 an electron produce? So uh, first of all, an electron that has uh, Lorentz factor gamma produces, uh, has a synchrotron energy, which is big gamma square. The little b is b over, that's in, electron rest masses. All these, all these energies we're talking about will be in electron rest masses. So uh, B is B over B critical and B critical is uh, uh, basically four times four times to the minus 10 to 13 Gauss. So the number of photons produced by an electron or a positron N is the energy of the electron divided by the energy of the photon and so that is roughly one over B gamma. And because B is very, very large, uh, one over B gamma, uh, B gamma is very, very small, I'm sorry. B is very, very small. B gamma is also small. So the number of photons you produce is much greater than one. So if the column density of the forward shock is sufficiently high, such that one of those end photons pair produces before it escapes, then it, it replaces itself. If it's a little higher than that, actually each generation produces more and more and more electron positron pairs and subs out very quickly on light crossing time across the forward shock, all the energy that's stored in the relativistic protons. And uh, uh, so here is a, uh, a diagram of that. So we have now an electron uh, produces, B is the magnetic field, 
produces an electron and gammas. The gamma goes out and hits the proton, produces electron positron pairs. And the question here is, uh, what is the kinematic threat? For, in order for a P gamma to produce an electron positron pair, then the energy of the synchrotron photon, which is B gamma square, on the rest frame of the proton has to be equal to twice the electron rest mass. So gamma times the synchron synchrotron photon energy has to be equal to 2 mc square, or because we use uh, dimensionless units, B times gamma cube has to be appro approximately or greater than two, and two in this case means one MeV. So here, this, pr this process has an inherent characteristic energy, here threshold energy, which of course uh, corresponds to a, a uh, characteristic energy of the synchrotron photons. All those photons have about the same energy and which is big gamma square, all the particles have energy approximately gamma times the rest mass. And so we have all of a sudden we can produce lots and lots of photons of energy big gamma square. And the next question is, uh, what is that energy on the earth rest frame? And the, earth, the energy of the rest, earth rest frame, because the whole thing the whole blast wave moves towards the Earth with Lorentz factor gamma. It will be gamma times E sub S, which is big gamma cube. But from, but this is the crit the criticality the kinematic criticality condition in order to be able to pair produce. So this threshold condition is uh, translated into characteristic photon energy observed on the Earth. And that should be roughly one MeV. Well, it's not exactly one MeV. We have parameters there. Uh, we have the redshift, first of all. Sometimes uh, it can be higher than one MeV because, bef well, as uh, you see why, uh, before the energy comes out, you also have to fulfill one more condition. The stability column density must be greater than one over N. So you may have the, uh, you may have this condition obeyed, but not this, in which case you have a very, very small flux of photons as the relativistic blast wave expands. However, when you have both conditions obeyed, and what's the second one? It means the column density to P gamma reaction, the column density is R times N times sigma P gamma, has to be, oh, this B is not bigger, should be there, greater than one over N, which is equal to B gamma. Multiply both sides by gamma square, and we have that the column density times gamma square has to be greater than B gamma cube. But B gamma cube, again, we said by the threshold conditions equal to two. So we have two conditions now we have to fulfill for this bomb to explode. The uh, uh, B gamma cube has to be greater than two because that is the condition and the photons per produce with the relativistic protons behind the shock. And the second condition is that the column density of the relativistic shock has to be large enough, times gamma square has to be large enough so that the whole thing explodes just like the, an atomic bomb does, becomes super critical. That's the criticality condition. This is the threshold condition. And uh, those are necessary for this relativistic blast wave to produce uh, and that's, of course, you can do all sorts of variants on that with uh, uh, going away from uh, a single energy for the protons to power laws and so on and so forth. But the underlying physics is exactly the same. And, of course, it gives us some characteristic energy, which it was not a priori clear that should have been there. Now, things get a little bit more interesting or uh, from the parameter space uh, point of view, easier to uh, materialize if there is a mirror ahead of the uh, blast wave and the mirror essentially is the uh, circumburst medium uh, the synchrotron photons which are of the order of the uh, few ev scatter there the scattering should be in the lyman uh, uh, alpha region because that is a very fast transition it's a uh, effectively a 
resonance scattering. So the photons basically scatter, get out of the, of the radial direction, in which case the mirror can, cap, can capture them again. If the photon doesn't go in the radial direction, scatters, then the mirror, the relativistic blast wave can actually recapture at an energy which is up by gamma square. And in these conditions, then uh, they both, uh, both the kinematic and the dynamic uh, thresholds become different. You have big gammas to the fifth now, because from big gamma cube, because of the increase of the photon of the, uh, of the photon energy by a factor of gamma square, this becomes big gamma to the fifth. And also the another gamma square multiplies the uh, uh, threshold condition for the, uh, for the dynamic threshold condition. Well, that's okay. So we, if we do the numbers, we find out that with gammas of the order of uh, uh, a few hundred, two to 300 and uh, densities of one, we can fulfill both conditions. However, if you have this mirror and the photos run onto the, and the blast wave runs in its own photons, then there will be a feedback onto the, uh, a, a force onto the momentum transfer onto the blast wave. And we estimated that this is the amount of the uh, uh, radiative force you have. It's proportional to gamma to the four. E dot is the uh, energy produced by the, uh, uh, by this, the synchrotron photons that upscatter. And this now, we can calculate this is, we can calculate the evolution of the shock. And we find out that induces a small de decrease in the Lorentz factor. So here is the, the calculation that shows uh, the relativistic shock increases linearly with R and eventually uh, gets uh, uh, an asymptotic Lorentz factor. How, and this red line tells you the distance at which the kinematic threshold is is fulfilled. That is the big gamma to the th three or big gamma to the fifth greater than two. You can pair produce now on the protons. And the green line shows you the distance at which the dynamical threshold that the column density can is uh, fulfilled. Of course, the fact that you just fulfill that doesn't mean that you also have, uh, you release a lot of energy. You wait for a little while, you pile up a lot, a lot more column. And at, th at that point, we have an explosion. The uh, explosion feedbacks on the uh, outflow decreases the Lorentz factor by a little bit. As you can see, maybe 30%, maybe 50%. However, because these are threshold conditions that has a dynamical effect onto the radiation that's emitted, all of a sudden you stop taking energy out of the protons onto the electrons, which means that the Lorentz, the luminosity of this blast wave has to drop by the proton to electron Lorentz factor, uh, mass ratio, about 2000. And here is from uh, uh, Nat Butler, some light curves. And this is the factor of the uh, 2000. And uh, so with Jude Dirac Wissing, we went and basically calculated, oh, we calculate. We measured uh, these ratios: the ratio between the plateau flux luminosity and the luminosity of the prompt emission. Maybe we should have gotten the luminosity of the peak, of the highest value, because that's what uh, uh, Maria has in his in her diagram there in the three-dimensional diagram. And once we did that, this is the diagram, the histogram we got, and you can see the histogram peaks at. Uh, roughly 2000. So here, and this was, of course, uh, in some sense, a prediction that said, if indeed that's the case, then we'll, if we change the Lorentz factor of the uh, blast wave by the feedback radiation by 30%, then we'll stop taking energy out of the protons into the electrons. Then the luminosity has to drop by a factor of uh, 2000. The, the, uh, as you can see here, I mean, this is a simple calculation of the relativistic outflow. Uh, the Lorentz factor after it dropped, it hasn't piled up enough material to start decelerating yet. So it continues with a uh, constant Lorentz factor until it reaches the deceleration radius, and then it starts decelerating. So 
in that case, in that sense, we have several things. We have we can calculate the uh, uh, we have a, a reason for the typical energy gamma ray burst to be one MeV, and we have a reasoning for why there should be a sharp decrease and plateau in the afterglow. And we relate now this ratio to the electron proton mass ratio. And this ratio, it was in some sense predicted. So uh, I'm, uh, I'd like to push that as a prediction of this particular model because we didn't know ahead of time how, how much would have been this, this ratio between the prompt and the plateau. Now, there, there are other ways to do that. And maybe uh, after reading Maria's paper, I'll find some reasons either to refute this proposal or to accept it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Demos, for uh, this very nice uh, and illustrative talk. Uh, and uh, there is probably a question by Asaf. I see that he has uh, the hands raised. Please, Asaf, go ahead. Uh, you are muted, Asaf, so we cannot hear you. Thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, I have two questions. The first question is, uh, did you calculate the expected spectrum uh, in this model and uh, compare it to, of course, what we're seeing? And the second question is, of course, the, you know, the main criticism about this um, proton dominated models is the uh, energy budget or the energy reservoir. Namely, that the amount of energy you need to put in the protons is, in, in some cases, depending on the scenario, could be larger than the amount of energy that you have as a kinetic energy. Uh, so I would like to ask you about this. Uh, well, let me see if I, I, well, I mean, that we have to be really together and go through numbers. But uh, uh, in general, the, uh, uh, the, the energy and relativistic protons behind the shock is essentially what you see, right? So. Uh, uh, now, and you, you have that some of that multiplied by gamma square to get 10 to the 54 ergs and so on and so forth. Uh, there are issues which are uh, far more nuanced in this case, uh, but uh, in, in general, I mean, whatever energy you put in the piston, you, you will convert it all into a relativistic, uh, into photons effectively. First into electrons and then into photons. That's uh, basic. Assuming 100% conversion of energy. From well, uh, okay, 100%. Okay, let's say 90%. Okay. <laughs> Something right. like that. Uh, we've done some, there is some papers there we can see with Apostles Mastichiadis. We've gone a little more detail into that. Uh, and I can send you the reference. Of course, you can find it yourself. But uh, uh, so that's one uh, one question. What is the other one? The, uh, the spectrum. Oh, they, so the spectrum yeah. should be the spectrum. Effectively, it should be a synchrotron spectrum. Uh, if it's through the mirror, now it becomes a little more interesting because then you you have an isotropic photon source into which you plow something, and uh, uh, we've done some calculations with a uh, black body. You know, then you get something which is not as steep as, or if you put a delta function. Uh, this go, has a low energy tail, which is uh, in UF nu is a uh, new, uh, new square. That is fairly straightforward calculations that if you have an isotropic distribution, it will be after the scattering and maybe more energetic photos and you plow them with a, uh, uh, with a piston. And uh, because they have isotropic distribution, different energies come to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, blast wave onto the, piston that hits them, and therefore the distribution in, in angle becomes a distribution in energy, and this gives you roughly new square instead of new tube that we get for a uh, black body. So uh, if you look at the 0909-2B, <laughs> you can do fits, better fits with uh, this uh, uh, scattering uh, uh, spectrum rather than a single black body, although it first sight looks like a black body. But uh, if you look at the low energy power law, you think that it's closer to a new square, actually. But those are, now, I find very interesting this uh, latest work by Organisian when they find out that they have the synchrotron spectrum that hits the optical. Uh, prompt optical emission has been 
really paramount in understanding the process, the, the process that produces the uh, uh, prompt emission. And I've been asking Judy, he says, oh, we have a dozen of uh, bursts. Well, we need more than a dozen of bursts. We need to build up a, uh, a good uh, sample and see if Organisian to what, uh, 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 how far the Organisian procedure works and produces, he claims, produces synchronous spectra there. That's, that's very interesting as far as I'm concerned. But, okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. I have, uh, although we are exceeding the time, but I, I have uh, just yeah. a quick question, a quick comment, because I think uh, it's very interesting, as you mentioned, the uh, demos uh, to check also what happens in the peak, if you consider yes. measure yes. the distances yes. in the peak yes. of the prompt emission. And I have another comment that uh, uh, it would be also nice to check, since you are checking at the beginning of the plateau phase, the luminosity at the beginning of the plateau phase, but since uh, in some cases, the plateau is not really flat. It has some, some angle, and this yes. angle varies. So then the luminosity at the end of the plateau, the flux at the end of the plateau may vary compared to the flux that in the beginning. So I, I think it would be nice also to check what it is the deviation from the main, uh, uh, you know, your, your main modeling, which you have like the isotropic uh, prompt emission, or you have the peak luminosity or the peak flux, and then what would be the deviation when you consider the uh, uh, flux at the end of the plateau emission? I have to go and read your papers again, uh, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, so I would like to uh, thank you, Demos, again, and uh, all the speakers of the session. So I just encourage a big applause for all of you and staying up too late or get up in very, very early. So we are closing now the first part of the, uh, of the session, uh, the gamma ray burst correlation, observational challenges, and theoretical interpretation. And we reconvene in uh, 10 minutes from now. From now. So stay tuned. See you in a bit. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. You're in Greece now? So you're not anymore in uh, in the Cork? No, I'm in Israel. Well, I yeah, I, I saw that. I saw that. Well, all right. Well, that's uh, Mazel Tov. What can I say? Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure you're happier there. I'm, well, some things are better. No, just one I mean, second. Your, your family, is there, right? Your family is there, so I, I assume that's simpler. I'm sorry, I had to shut down the phone. Uh, okay. There are sites. It's different, you know. It's different. It's some some things are better, of course. Some things are. I'm not sure that they are better. Did you it's, get to talk uh, to Denise at all about her work? Yes, I did. Of course, we had a lot of uh, communication. You know, she retired, Denise. Oh, she did. I see. Wow. Yeah, we we co-authored a number of papers together. I know. Well, she she decided on early retirement. I think you know oh. that uh, she wasn't supposed I'm to retire. Deciding, I'm deciding on late retirement. <laughs> well, you know, she got married. And it was not that long ago, and she decided that uh, you know she has enough money. And she wants to spend the rest of her life doing things with her husband. I see. Yeah, I understand. They're not, they're not, I understand. That, uh, yes, that's right. Not that they, young anymore. They had the honeymoon in uh, Western Peloponnese, actually, if I understand correctly. Well, uh, that I do not. She never. She never. Oh, honeymoon. Uh, one of their trips shortly after they got married. Yes, because uh, they visit my friend Yanis in Athens. And, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that, yes. Right. So yeah, you know, she was. Uh, she decided on her, an early retirement. And uh, yeah, I got this uh, offer, basically, which is uh, one of those really good offers. Basically, I'm uh, establishing an astrophysics um, research group in uh, the only research university in Israel which had no astrophysics. Okay, and which where, where are you now? Which you uh, called, called Bar Ilan? It's in the outskirts of Tel Aviv. It's in, in Ramat Gan, which what? is just okay. Uh, all right, uh, Barilan. Yes, that's right. Uh, I, I noticed the uh, I noticed the affiliation. Okay. Well, I, I, so they had Tel Aviv, they, I, I've been to Tel Aviv. I I, I thought it was a beautiful city. <laughs> it is absolutely a bit hot now, but uh, I guess you're used to that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So 
so yeah it's uh, it is the only I was pretty fortunate I guess this, this is the only university in Israel that had no astrophysics and they wanted somebody to open okay. up an astrophysics well all right Mo and more power maybe, to you then uh, uh, maybe uh, you organize the Yamari burst uh, workshop I'll come <laughs> awesome. absolutely I'm happy to invite you <laughs> all right <laughs> so, well, it's good to see you uh maybe absolutely. i'll go to bed now my i'm on vacation now I'm supposed to be on vacation my wife is very upset i'm staying late <laughs> i'm so sorry Demos. this it's is okay. my fault <laughs> are you are you uh are you uh in the u.s now or are you in greece no no i'm in uh, in the u.s i did not go back to greece so for what's the time now yeah. it's 3 3 a.m what's the time right now no it's 2 10. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, yes. well yeah, I should go to sleep, I guess. I'll I'll watch the rest in the uh they, they tape all of them, right? So I can watch the rest in the of the yes. meeting afterwards. Well, uh Maria, it was good to see you and I uh yes. well all the best uh, for you for so you now permanently you, Jay, Na National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. Yes, oh. okay. So you're in all Japan. Right. Yes, I moved uh, in uh, to this new position in January, January what, this year. Okay. Well, congratulations. What what kind of position is that? Is assistant permanent assistant professor uh, position. Okay. Well, oh. good luck. Well, next time I'm in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you are welcome to 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 come here and to give a seminar, and uh, we can uh, speak Thank more you. about gamma uh, I have to. Yeah, I have to read all these papers with a uh, three dimensional now diagram. That's <laughs> Yes. Yes. Uh, um, um, tomorrow we have well it will be difficult for you because of the hours but uh, we're going to speak about me and my post of course now we'll be speaking about uh, new results we have which are to me at least very exciting from where from yes, it... what it's tomorrow at 9 a.m i think right so it's the same time as your talk right now 24 hours from now yes okay yes. all right <laughs> I, I, I have to say good night for to you <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you again, Demos. See thank you soon. You. Bye. You yes. Bye. 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 How to close it? Okay. How do you find your phone? Uh, Very good so far. Good. So I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to switch the the headphones. So I'll just try to make a change. I have to stop share first, and then I have to. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Uh, as, uh, as good as before. Mm -hmm. A bit less good okay. than before. It was as, as similar as before, yes, the audio. No, no, it's less good. Before was better. It's less good, okay. So then I changed that. That's why I use the other headphones. Uh, now, now we have some better. So I don't know. Yeah, but it's uh, without uh, without the headphones and I. Uh, So I think in three minutes we are going to start again. So maybe I would like to ask Alexander that didn't try the presentation. Alexander, do you want to quickly share the screen? Please. Uh, okay, I can do it in a moment. Okay, you should see my presentation. Yes, can you can you put in the full mode so that we can see? Yes. Okay, do you still see? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks.
Did the Sam also try the presentation? Sam, did you try the presentation? Probably you did. Uh, so you no, I haven't. Yeah, so if you want to get uh, just a moment to try the presentation, we still have two, two minutes before we see. start again. Okay, can you see? Yes, yes. Okay, amazing. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Okay, so welcome back to the second part of the first day of the gamma reverse correlations, observational challenges, and the theoretical interpretation. I also would like to remind that we have another session on Wednesday and another session on Friday at the same time, 6.30, 9.30 uh, Central European time. And now I would like to welcome the uh, second part, as I said, uh, with a series of talk by students. The first one uh, is by Samuel Young from uh, University of Pennsylvania, the optical two and the three dimensional fundamental plane correlations for more than 130 gamma reverse afterglows. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the um, nice introduction, Dr. Denori. Um, so, uh, I will be uh, presenting on the current optical two and three dimensional fundamental plane relations for uh, this large sample of gamma ray burst afterglows. Um, although it is me um, doing this presentation, this is a, an absolutely large group effort between all of these authors down here, as well as a few more uh, who uh, Dr. Dinodi has um, increased. So we have a large team of people working on this uh, nice correlation. So it is, I'm just one of them. Okay, so um, just as a brief overview of what I'll be talking uh, about during this presentation, I will give you um, uh, once again, a recap of uh, what I mean by the optical two and three dimensional fundamental plane correlations. I will talk about the current uh, correlations we have seen in X-ray very briefly, uh, as well as the 3D fundamental plane uh, where we have, um, the peak luminosity as well uh, introduced to that correlation in addition to the time and uh, luminosity at the end of the plane. Uh, then I'll talk about the uh, current two and 3D correlations in the optical, compare them with what we have seen in X-ray. And then finally, um, I will end the talk with talking about the current uh, search process and, and how we're going about doing that as uh, this is a very work in progress subject uh, and we have a lot, lot more light curves and, and data points to uh, sort of discover and put into uh, creating a much tighter correlation. So from before and from previous talks by Dr. Denodi and others, we will be looking at the correlation between the luminosity uh, and time at the end of the plateau. You can see uh, that black point in the center, um, the, end, the end of the plateau of the uh, light curve from gamma ray bursts. And then we'll also be looking at at that 2D correlation um, with the added uh, single point of the peak luminosity flux. Um, and so the idea of course is uh, if you have a uh, higher peak luminosity flux, there's more energy uh, coming out of that gamma ray burst and uh, that will be correlated with the plateau end. So of course we have, uh, there have been previous uh, uh, luminosity time correlations um, in X-ray, they have been uh, well-defined 
And um, as X-ray uh, data points are the most abundant, they, we, they have the tightest correlations thus far. Um, the close second is an optical uh, in terms of, you know, data population. Um, and of course, that's what this talk is about. Uh, there is um, another uh, luminosity time correlation uh, in X, uh, in radio, excuse me, that is currently being uh, looked at. It is done uh, by Delina and uh, Delina Levine, another uh, presenter in a few talks, maybe after this, uh, I forgot. Um, uh, so stay tuned if you'd like to hear about that uh, in radio, because uh, that is very, uh, not talked about a ton uh, and it's uh, cutting edge. So we see uh, that nice correlation in X-ray. Well, what about the optical? So um, of course, uh, many uh, light curves uh, do not care about uh, what sort of um, band you're looking at them in. So whether it's X-ray, optical, or radio, they will uh, many of them exhibit the same sort of uh, peak and uh, plateau. Um, previous work by uh, Dr. Danotti uh, et al. from the uh, latter half of 2020, um, what, there was a nice survey of 102 gamma ray bursts um, uh, that were used to find the correlation between that luminosity and time at the end uh, plateau peak. You can see in this uh, nice plot on the right, um, you have uh, the entire um, correlation plotted out with the fitted lines. And there is a discrimination between what are called the gold sample um, data points and uh, the gamma ray burst data points. Of course, the gold sample data points um, are those with uh, that angle of less than 41 degrees. Um, it was as Dr. Dinoti was talking about earlier. And uh, an additional uh, at least four or more points uh, after the initial start of that end plateau. So good coverage during that plateau. And of course, uh, uh, a fit with that gold sample uh, yields much better uh, tighter correlations and uh, reduce intrinsic scatter. Uh, well, what about today? So from uh, that latter half of 2020, we have continued our search. Um, we have found an additional uh, 29 gamma ray bursts with more counting. Uh, you can see in this plot on the left, we have uh, the entire uh, LATA, or I guess LOPT TA, um, Plotted, uh, correlation plotted out right here with each class. You can see um, there is a, while uh, there are uh, much more points, um, that uh, correlation is still there as it is a work in progress. We don't have um, the current uh, intrinsic scatter we're looking at, but um, uh, very roughly the uh, correlation uh, is seeming to improve. As you can see on the right over here, um, this is the histogrammed uh, distribution of um, the time uh, at the end of the plateau between uh, our optical light curves and X-ray light curves um, that we have. And you could, as you can see, uh, we did a simple t-test, uh, and we concluded that um, you can very well uh, see that these two distributions aren't significantly different from each other and are uh, correlated. So this isn't a statistical fluke from um, selection bias, which is great to hear. Now, uh, in addition, uh, as I said, we added 22, uh, 29 uh, more gamma ray bursts. Uh, during, these, uh, during adding these gamma ray bursts, we also wanted to look back into uh, how uh, we determined our gold sample distribution. Uh, like I said in this uh, previous slide, we only looked at uh, how many points were after uh, um, sorry, how many points, if, if there are four more points after this uh, TT that we have defined, if there are more than four points and it's before uh, the end of that plateau, it is a gold sample. However, the thing is, even if there are, uh, say, four or more points in your plateau, uh, this, this could still lead to um, uh, light curves that aren't uh, too great, that have lots of uh, spacing between their points. So we further um, created a better uh, sort of metric of what we considered in the gold sample. And that is by using two uh, additional metrics, one being delta T max and delta F max. So delta T max, um, you can also see them in the top right for this particular GRB. Delta T max is the largest change in uh, the time. So that's the X axis between the first five points after the uh, initial plateau start. And so what that does, that gives us a metric of uh, spacing between points. And it's you know, um, 
seems to be quite good. Uh, and then, uh, so on top of that, we also looked at Delta F max, which is much like Delta T max. It is the largest difference between the uh, Y axis here, the log flux uh, between the first five points after the TT. So those are the red points on this plot right here. We've determined from looking at uh, our entire sample of around 70, uh, 69 candidates, uh, where we saw less than 41 degrees. Um, we saw that cuts like this, uh, like these two cuts where we uh, looked at only um, delta T maxes with less than uh, 0.11 and less than 0.205, we saw that uh, there, uh, the, the sample distribution that came out of those cuts, um, those statistical cuts uh, were good. Uh, we see uh, uh, many light curves or every single light curve is uh, well-defined, uh, the plateau is well-defined and we see um, fantastic uh, light curve fits uh, with the W07 uh, phenomenological um, uh, function that we fit to these light curves. So that is a gold sample. And um, so this is that uh, updated plot we currently see. So if I go back two slides, this is the old plot. So if we go forward, you can see our sample has increased greatly and uh, we still are seeing this uh, tight correlation. As I have said before, this is very much so work in progress. This is kind of like a middle point for our survey. So um, I don't have the exact uh, intrinsic scatter that we have from uh, fitting these points. But as you can see, we are very greatly increasing this um, our current distribution. And we have also um, increased our uh, platinum distribution to 16 which is quite a bit because before we only had, you know, around seven um, GRBs that were in the gold sample. So this is a very, very large in increase um, and is very exciting for the future. Uh, we've also um, looked at the uh, 3D correlation in optical with the fundamental plane. Previously, this was not uh, seen in uh, Dr. Denodi's 2020 uh, paper. This was not looked at. Um, I have great news. Um, the 3D correlation does in fact hold in the optical, um, not just the X-ray. So as you can see, this is a preliminary plot we have right here. Um, like I said, we are currently on the search. Um, I will talk about in the uh, later um, bit of the presentation, uh, what that search looks like, but uh, it is awesome to see that this uh, fundamental plane is seen. Um, you can see uh, everything uh, in, in this nice correlation here. So, uh, what are we doing now uh, from today? Um, as Dr. Dinoti said in her earlier talk, we are uh, looking at using additional data from Subaru to uh, recover and enhance previously discarded light curves. This is extremely important because um, in the past, we've looked at around 300 separate light curves, and there are more than 150 that we had to discard due to too few points, uh, errors in um, error bar, you know, discrimination or determination, which had to do again with too few points and so on. And so uh, looking back and adding these additional Subaru points, uh, much like as we see in this plot of GRB 010222, we see a fantastic um, uh, benefit to uh, the actual light curves in these distributions. So we can have um, better uh, fittings to that phenomenological model and uh, then on tighter, uh, better you know, um, LA and TA for our uh, correlations and so on. Um, so this is extremely important. Like I said, there are more than 150 previously discarded light curves that we are looking back to. Um, and not only are we looking back, we're doing it very efficiently. So um, I'll talk in a little bit, but we are developing a, an, an open source tool that will um, allow us to search, uh, perform literature searches and searches through uh, the NASA GCN Circular Archive that will quickly and efficiently um, extract, uh, convert, and plot to these light curves. So no longer will we have to, you know, manually go through every single gamma ray burst to get their data points, which is quite exciting. So uh, as I said, we although we have 131 uh, current light curves that we're using in this correlation, uh, we have an additional 277 light curves we have currently uh previously um not looked at so this is extremely exciting as i said i think we looked at 277 ish uh before so we can effectively possibly double this sample if if our 
if our current search uh, goes in uh, the exact same way as our previous search. Um, currently, with um, the uh, sort of beta version of our um, lit search uh, searcher and GCN searcher and data extractor, we found that for this entire uh, light curve um, data set, we see this is the distribution of data points that we are uh, seeing through PDFs and uh, the GCNs. And so what we did is um, we performed a cut at around five on this x-axis right here. So everything more than five are, um, at any gamma ray burst that has more than five data points, roughly, we will be uh, looking at. And so um, right now we have a team of uh, 13 amazing individuals. I believe we are adding more uh, and, and we are all working extremely hard um, to gather these new light curves and, and get this new data. And so as you can see, this is a, a bit more of a breakdown of the actual uh, data point distribution. We can see uh, a small amount come from sentences. So in paragraphs uh, within you know, GCN circulars, um, uh, a larger amount come from uh, tables. And then we have uh, a, a decent amount from articles as well. Finally, um, as I said, uh, the, the amazing thing. So uh, anyone who um, currently is not working on this sort of stuff, you will in the very soon, uh, very, very uh, soon, you will be able to as well with uh, ease actually. So we're creating an uh, open source Python package uh, for better data gathering and wrangling for non-SWIFT data sets. Uh, we will eventually extend this out to, um, of course, X-ray and radio, although right now we are currently uh, looking at optical sort of things, um, although it shouldn't be uh, too hard. Um, so what we're going to do uh, right now, we have a very, very rough sketch uh, and a very rough interpretation uh, implementation, but uh, we are planning for uh, one package to do everything for you with minimal uh, oversight. So we will automatically search literature and uh, GCN circular notices. We will look for data points. So for example, uh, the R band magnitude for, uh, from a, a singular um, telescope um, that reported uh, that value through um, the a GCN uh, circular notice. Uh, we will download and parse all of this. We will convert everything to, um, for example, we are dealing with lots of bands within the optical K, U, R, I, G, um, everything. Uh, so this will perform you know, automatic on the fly conversion. And then finally, uh, we will have everything plotted and fitted automatically. So hopefully uh, right now you can uh, track the development at this GitHub link right now. Uh, we are in a very pre-alpha stage. We have you know, around five uh, great um, programmers working on this right now. We may add more in the future, um, but Hopefully by the end of August, we will have uh, something nice working. Um, uh, and yeah, this is extremely exciting. Um, so for the broader scientific community, hopefully this will you know, be able to help you out. Thank you. That is okay. all. Thank you very much, Sam, for your representation. And now I would like to hear if there are questions from, uh, from the audience. Questions or comments, of course. Okay, if not, I would like just to add a comment uh, related to the work that uh, we are doing. Uh, basically, this part is more complex and more challenging than the previous part that was already published because in the published work, we were using data that were already published and gathered from the literature. In this case, uh, as Sam was showing, we are also going to parse through the circular notice. And as we all know, the circular notice uh, sometimes are uh, preliminary uh, uh, work or uh, preliminary data that are shared. So uh, we are in contact with the, uh, the people that have been uh, working on optical light curve data analysis for a long time. And uh, some of them are uh, were also uh, Alan that it was in, uh, in the call previously. So um, as Sam said, we hope to uh, increase the sample by two, but uh, we must be cautious because since uh, uh, um, we are also parsing through the ones that have more than five data points uh, and they are not too much scattered as a requirement for attempting a fit, then uh, more realistically, we will increase the sample, but not, not reaching this, uh, uh, you know, exactly uh, doubling it. 
Okay, so uh, uh, how often do the GCN have errata? Does your pipeline have the ability to consider corrections? Yes. So Don, this is a very nice question. So sometimes it's not so often that we have the uh, GCN uh, uh, errata coverage, but sometimes it happens. So uh, this is something that we haven't implemented yet in the in the in the routine, but it is something that uh, that we can do. So. Um, from time to time, we can, for example, we can add a keyword. So this dictionary of the Python routine is created with the, with the keywords. So you can put, for example, Subaru telescope, Swift telescope, and you know other. And if you are interested in this particular uh, uh, data, and then we can also add uh, the, for example, errata corrige among the GCN that we have already downloaded. So I think this can be very, very helpful because the data gathering, it was very uh, time consuming in the first, uh, in the first part of the, of the analysis. So uh, then I decided that it was time uh, to spend some time in automatic uh, automatizing, even though one of the great difficulty in this uh, in this work is that each GCN, as you know, has its own uh, uh, way of writing the information. So parsing also, it's not so, so easy through the code. Yeah. Okay. Also, um, an another issue with that uh, we've been seeing is um, pairing or, or being able to establish uh, what time you're getting your data points. So in addition to, to your data points, of course, that's uh, the y-axis and that's the flux we're looking at. We also need the time. And so um, GCNs vary quite a bit in um, the exact or how they report their times. Um, some, some are in decimal days, some are in seconds since uh, the original trigger. Um, and somewhere in UT time. So uh, that's also something we're looking at. Okay, so thank you again, Sam. And now it's time to move on to the next talk of the speaker, Delina Levin. She will tell us about examining 2D luminosity and correlation for gamma ray burst radio afterglows. Okay, hello, can everyone see my screen? We can. Okay, great. So hi, I'm Delina. I'm an undergraduate at the University of Maryland. And yes, as we mentioned, I've been looking at radio afterglows. So as we've heard in plenty of talks, we know why GRBs are important, but just a reminder of why uh, my the motivation behind my work, uh, GRBs can probe the early universe and can be observed at extremely high redshifts, which would make them very useful as standard candles if we could standardize them. But of course, the problem is that GRBs are very difficult to standardize because they are so varied. However, as Sam just uh, presented in his presentation, and as Dr. Donati spoke about earlier, a proposed solution is the 2D Donati relation between luminosity and time uh, related to light curve plateaus. And this relation has been observed in optical and X-ray wavelengths previously. So my goal of my work was to determine the existence of radio plateaus in the light curves of radio afterglows and examine this 2D relation in radio, which would be the first time that this analysis has been done with radio afterglow data and therefore the first multi-wavelength study as we compare our radio results to the X-ray and optical results that we've obtained previously. So in order to do this work, we had to obtain our sample. So we took our sample from published radio afterglows in the literature. So here, this table four is an example of the largest table that we used from Chandra and Frail in 2012. Um, and this uh, table is a catalog from about 1997 to 2012. And then we extended our sample up to about 2020. So from our literature search, we found a total of 366 GRBs. However, as uh, Dr. Donati just mentioned, um, in order to fit the sample, it's, uh, there's a pretty uh, stringent requirement of um, data points that you need. So first we had to filter out our sample to discard all upper limits, which is um, anything that wasn't a clear observation with an uncertainty. And after discarding upper limits, we were left with 191 GRBs. And then we had to, we can only do uh, the fitting analysis to a light curve that has greater than five points within the same frequency. So after discarding any GRBs that did not fit this criteria, we were left with a sample of 64 GRBs. So with these 64 GRBs, we then attempted a broken power law fitting to each of them using this broken power law equation from Bowerman in 1999. And here's an example of one of the light curves that we fit. So this one is actually a very nice uh, light curve. As you can see that there's a very clear plateau, which is a slope of almost zero. Um, so here's the plateau. Then we have the green circle denoting the time of break. And then this is the power law decay. And we can see that this is a particularly nice fit, not just visually, but be also by looking at the confidence intervals that are automatically generated by the fit. Uh, we see that there's no errors here. 
So by conducting a chi-squared analysis, we see that for each parameter, the parabolas are symmetric. There's no breaks or otherwise odd features. So this uh, CRV was included in our uh, plateau sample. However, most of our uh, data did not look like this. A lot of it was uh, too scattered to be able to fit this broken power law, or it was just the incorrect shape. Or even if it looked visually accurate, uh, the first part of this plateau would be too steep to be considered a plateau, or there would be errors or odd features here. So after doing this fitting, we found that there were 21 light curves that presented this plateau feature. And of those 21, some of them were the same GRB and repeated frequencies. So we were left with 16 GRBs that had a plateau. So we moved on to look at this 2D correlation in luminosity and time. Uh, so this is the luminosity and this is the rest frame and time of the plateau. So that was that green circle. Um, and this is a plot of the 21 light curves that I mentioned on the previous slide. And we can see that the correlation does exist and it has a slope of negative two. However, in comparing this to the previous correlations observed in X-ray and optical, we see that the slope is not compatible. Uh, X-ray and optical correlations both have a slope of about negative one. And of course, we just said the radio has a slope of about negative two. Uh, however, this free slope of negative two is compatible with our physical expectations using the standard fireball model, which was the model that we're seeing is underlying all of our analysis. So though it is not compatible, this actually does match our expectations for the radio example. Uh, we can also see pretty clearly from this graph uh, that the end time of the plateau in optical and x-ray occurs a lot earlier than that of the radio. And to get a closer look at this, we just plotted the uh, time end of rest, rest frame end of plateau time distribution. Um, and here we see that the X-ray and optical again has a very clear overlap while the radio occur, uh, break, time of break occurs much later. Um, and just to confirm this, we conducted a Kolmogorov smirnov um, test and we found that this can, can allow us to conclude that these are two statistically different distributions. So the radio sample does behave differently than the X-ray and the optical. So we wanted to get a better understanding of our radio sample. So to do this, we went and looked at the population study and we wanted to see why some radio light curves were selected for our plateau sample and not others. So for the most part, the answer to this question is fairly obvious. Either it presented a plateau or it didn't. Um, and a lot of times it didn't present a plateau because the data was too scattered. However, there were some fits that actually did look visually correct, but had other errors or uh, were simply too steep to be considered a plateau. And we wanted to look into the class of GRB and other variables such as the isotropic energy, the T90, or the jet opening angle to see if that would give us any information as to why this um, could have been the case. So first we wanted to look at the classes to un better understand our approved sample. So here we plot the, uh, the approved GRBs as 21 light curves by class and we do a KS test between long GRBs, which are these blue circles, and all other types of GRBs in our sample, since you can see that the long GRBs are far more numerous than the others. And from this test, we can also conclude that the long GRB population and the other class population are statistically different. So if we can extend this to our larger sample, perhaps of 64 GRBs, this could potentially give us even more information about perhaps the underlying um, progenitor for the GRB. We also wanted to look at the greater sample of 64 GRBs, especially in the EISO versus T90. But in order to do this, we first had to k-correct both of those variables to adjust for their correlation with redshift. And we did this by using the efron petrosian method. So I'll give a brief overview. Actually, a fellow student, Alexander, is going to give a more in-depth overview in his talk in a little bit. Um, but briefly, if you're, let's say, for example, this is EISO, uh, we plot EISO versus redshift and set a lower limit. And we can then use this to track the evolution of 1 plus c. And where this crosses 0, we get a k value. So for EISO, we had a k value of 2.5. And for T90, we had a k, a k value of uh, 0.005. So if we plot these k-corrected values against each other, uh, we can examine their correlation. And we see that there is a correlation with a slope of 0.77. So this is for the full sample of 64 approved, um, for 64 GRBs that were able to be analyzed with the fitting process. Um, and we categorize them by what sample they were uh, have fallen into. So the blue circles here are the ones that were accepted for the plateau study. Uh, the red circles here are those that actually fit fairly well, but that first part of the light curve was too steep to be considered a plateau. So instead, we put those in a sample of closure relations, which actually my fellow student Kevin, who's uh, part of this, I'm presenting on his behalf as well as he helped uh, extensively with the fitting of the light curves. 
Um, so he's been studying these GRBs to look at their closure relationships, and then the black points are those that were not accepted into either sample. So from this plot, we can also see that there seems to be a much wider distribution of those that were not separate, um, put into either sample than those that were. And to get a closer look at this, we looked at the distribution of T90. And again, we can see that those that were not accepted to either sample have a much wider distribution than those that were. And when we conduct a KS statistic, um, KS test, sorry, on this, we can uh, see that we can't conclude that these are two distinct populations. So we we're hoping that the EISO and T90 uh, would give us a way to discriminate between these two, but we cannot confidently say that it does. So from this analysis, we can conclude that 16 GRBs presented radio plateaus, which means that there is, it seems that they are not very common. Um, however, the L 2D LT correlation does exist, and though it is not compatible with previous observations in X-ray and optical, it is compatible with our physical expectations. Uh, the time of break or the end time of the plateau occurs a lot later in radio, and we can see that the radio makes up a different sample than X-ray and optical. And if we look at GRB classification within our radio sample, we can see that there are two statistically different samples in there as well. And um, finally, looking at the correlation between T EISO and T90, we cannot conclude that there is a two statistically different, uh, statistically yes, different samples. So um, overall, we would need to do more analysis on our data. So um, in order to do some more analysis, uh, we were going to look at the in, um, properties of the jet opening angle, theta j. So we wanted to look at its relationship with EISO and potentially obtain the number density and Lorentz gamma factor. We also wanted to investigate the relationship between this angle and the density and radius of the underlying progenitor of the GRB and see if that could help us differentiate between our populations. And lastly, we were hoping to increase sample size. As, as you saw, our sample size got reduced very, very strongly. So um, we're hoping to do a to use the GRB crawler or the GCN crawler that Sam mentioned in his previous presentation to do a more in-depth um, literature search and see if we can potentially increase our uh, sample size and maybe improve our correlation. But anyway, that is uh, all of my time. So I'd like to thank everyone who made this possible. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Delina. So it's now time for the questions from the audience. Do you have some questions or comments for Delina? Okay, if not, I would like just to make a comment regarding the time end of the plateau that we wanted to further investigate if this is compatible. Actually, we are not sure yet whether or not it is, uh, uh, we have already shown that practically it is not compatible with the plateau in, uh, in X-ray and optical. So now we want to check what it is the connection with uh, the jet break. So uh, this is another step that, uh, that we are going to, to take in the, next, uh, in the next days, as well as uh, we wanted to investigate uh, um, if, uh, uh, for the 16 cases that shows this flat part of the of the light curve, we can uh, we can uh, use the a toy model, the magnetar model that I was uh, presenting in uh, in uh, in my talk, and uh, uh, it is a, a modification of uh, Kontopoulos and Spikovsky uh, 2006 uh, 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 paper. So this is our, our the next step. Also, we were we were thinking um, uh, recently to uh, uh, apply some uh, besides the closure relationship uh, analysis, maybe uh, other uh, other analysis. And I think probably in future we will speak more with Don Warren about possible uh, possible interpretation. In fact, there is a question by Don right now. So radio afterglow should be rising at early time. Do you have afterglow that rise and then become a plateau? Um, yes, there are cases uh, that, that show this feature. And uh, um, we haven't shown in this presentation yet, but definitely it is something that, uh, that we are planning to, uh, to, to look more, uh, more closely. So thank you so much, uh, Don, for this uh, important, uh, important comment. Are uh, there are any any other questions or comments? 
Okay, if not, we thank Delina again for the nice presentation and we move on on the next talk of the session, uh, which is uh, uh, Via Nilsson, the, the next speaker of the session who is Via Nilsson. Uh, she will tell us about, from University of Michigan, she will tell us about GLB cosmology with the fundamental plane in optical and X-rays and feasibility of GRB samples for future cosmological application. Yes, can you see my screen okay? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Yes, thank you for the introduction. My name is Via. Um, I'm an undergraduate at the University of Michigan. Um, and I would like to talk today about how we can use X-ray, uh, GRB data and optical um, as cosmological tools. So, okay, to briefly define an outline, I will first describe the correlations that exist between gamma ray burst light curve features and how we can use them to standardize GRBs as cosmological probes. And then we'll look at results obtained from uh, the addition of supernova 1A and baryonic acoustic oscillation data to the GRB samples, both in X ray and optical wavelengths. Then, using the simulated GRBs, um, we'll be able to use probability maps to estimate the number of GRBs needed to accurately constrain cosmological parameters. And finally, we'll look ahead to satellite missions that will be supplying this number of GRBs to us in the near future. So, as has been previously mentioned, in the plight to use standard candles to constrain the value of things like the matter content of the universe today, or omega m, um, discrepancy in this value is found because supernova type 1a have been observed only up until redshifts about uh, 2.26, and so therefore we need to extend the cosmic distance ladder, and thus we employ a secondary standardizable candle at high redshift or gamma ray bursts. So gamma ray bursts, as mentioned, um, are not yet standard candles um, because of the heterogeneity in their luminosities, but can be standardized using the uh, tight correlations between their properties. So these corrections define our first goal, and our second is to actually add these standardized gamma ray bursts to the supernova data to reduce discrepancy on cosmological parameters. So this is the 3D fundamental plane, which has been mentioned in the last few presentations, but I'm going to go over it uh, briefly uh, because there exists the reliable two-dimensional correlation between the X-ray rest frame end time, TX, on the slide here and its corresponding luminosity at the end of the plateau, and that's LX. Um, and this is the Donati relation. And since then, the third correlated GRB parameter, the um, uh, peak luminosity has been added, and we see a significant decrease in the intrinsic scatter of the relative, relative 2D correlation. And we call this the fundamental plane. And it's described by that equation you see up on the slide where C is the normalization parameter, while A and B are the best fit parameters related to TX and L peak respectively. So we fit and compute all of these parameters using the Bayesian D'Agostini method because it takes into account error bars on all of these variables. So we first define this 3D fundamental plane for a subset of our full GRB sample. So we start from uh, 222 GRBs and we extract 50 to be a part of what we call the platinum sample. And um, the morpho morphological criteria for this sample is listed on the right here. Um, and the fitted platinum sample is shown on the left. You see the edge projection of the 3D plane it lies on. Uh, this sample we've defined has red shifts that range all the way up into five, actually. So using this, um, we've decided that we want an even tighter fit plane than what the platinum sample yields. So we pare down this X-ray sample even further to only the gamma ray bursts that hold the scatter about zero. And this is done by calculating those closest to the fundamental plane. And we determine this number to be about 13 from the full sample and refer to this subsample as the trimmed platinum sample. So as you can see, uh, on the table here, by trimming the platinum sample, we achieve a large decrease in intrinsic plane scatter. 
Um, however, we do not use the sample as a sole probe. The platinum sample is combined with supernova 1A data and baryon acoustic oscillation data. The addition of BAOs as standard rulers allows us to measure the distances to the gamma ray burst with respect to their redshift. And to then compute the best fit value for omega M, we compare the fundamental plane correlation of the 13 GRBs with the observed data. And to do this, we begin Monte Carlo chain sampling. So this approach allows omega M to vary together with the fundamental plane parameters within the sampling. And we find that this trimmed platinum sample plus supernova plus BAO assembly yields a omega M value of 0.307 with an error of 0.006 as shown there in the table. So it makes clear that the trimmed platinum sample is more efficacious in the reduction of overall scatter and consequently on the air on omega M. Apologies, my cat would like to say hello. Anyways, um, in fact, this assembly yields the smallest air yet. Furthermore, uh, we switch from analyzing GRBs and X-ray to analysis and optical wavelengths for a new sample of 45 GRBs as mentioned in the last uh, presentation. And once again, we use the D'Agostini methodology to compute the 3D fundamental plane parameters and intrinsic scatter of the full optical sample. And we first note that this intrinsic scatter of the plane is about 0.55, which is much, much higher in comparison to the scatter of about 0.36 for the X-ray plane. Uh, nevertheless, we perform the same sampling as before using the full optical GRB sample in conjunction with supernova and BAO data to once again determine a value for omega M. And this optical sample produces a value with an error on omega M of 0 0.007 as seen in the left figure. And the error on this value is not much higher than on those obtained by the X-ray samples as shown in the right for comparison. And so therefore we find that the use of optical GRB samples may prove efficacious with a larger or better sample size. And this leads us to perform a similar trim on this optical data as to the one performed on the X-ray sample. And that's what this slide here shows. So we compute again and use only those optical GRBs closest to the plane as to produce a near zero scatter and observe results with errors competitive with the X-ray data. So this just proves that the optical GRB data can be just as serviceable as X-ray data in constraining cosmological parameters for future research. And still our computational, uh, the computations in this presentation continue uh, using only X-ray data because the sample of such is slightly larger uh, with less intrinsic scatter on the 3D fundamental plane. So the precise plane that the trimmed X-ray platinum sample defined earlier is now being used as a base for simulating additional gamma ray bursts for the purpose of predicting the number needed to use X-ray GRB emissions as standalone standard candles. And so uh, to do so, we have generated randomly values of the peak luminosity and X-ray rest frame end time, assuming a Gaussian distribution. And the same has been done for the errors on these values and the K corrections. So this has been done for different numbers of randomly generated GRBs and dividing the errors on the data, which enter the D'Agostini likelihood for different quantities. And still further analysis has been conducted by simulating scatter on the luminosity at the end of the X-ray plateau, uh, computed starting from the random generated data in order to mimic the realistic presence of innate dispersions. And so we again do this by introducing a random noise based on a Gaussian distribution. So the goal with simulating this sort of data is to reach an error on omega m that is either, either equal to or less than that which has been obtained by supernova 1a as a standalone probe using GRBs as the standalone probe. And this limit as shown here on the slide is 0 0.022. And these are the first results we obtained from the simulations. 
We see that when we divide the errors on the data, which enter the D'Agostini likelihood by one, therefore leaving them unchanged, uh, we do in fact stay under the limit on the error of omega m as defined by the supernova data. And um, we see, however, that the number of GRVs needed to achieve this high precision is quite great. To hit this error, you see that we require 2,700 GRVs. So to reduce this number, we now divide the errors on the data by a factor of two, and we see that when we simulate 1,300 GRBs in contrast, we do in fact reach the limit on the error of omega n. And when we jump to dividing the errors by a factor of 10, we're now looking at only around 1,150 GRBs needed. So taking these insights, we ran multiple simulations for a number of GRBs to see when the number of GRBs added becomes too many in comparison to the reduction of error that they actually supply. And so this slide here shows the convergence on the omega m parameter to about 0.3 as the number of GRBs increases. Um, and these simulations were run leaving the errors as they were divided by one. And then taking this data, uh, we constructed a probability map on the value of omega as computed by the simulations. And this was created by taking the Monte Carlo chains and computing the probability density function on each simulation, which you see there on the left, uh, the left 3D plot there. And we converted this density then to a probability. And so this was interpolated multidimensionally to achieve the map shown on the right, as is evident from this figure. Uh, we see no closed contours for a number of gamma ray bursts less than about 2700, which does coincide with the information presented earlier. However, uh, if we want to only look at this supernova 1a error limit of 0 0.022 on omega, we can define this new contour plot where the gray line now defines this error limit. And this shows that leaving the likelihood errors unchanged, we can use GRBs as standalone standard candles for a number as low as 2300. So we also consider the case in which the errors that go into the likelihood are divided by two. And this division makes the convergence to an omega m value much more quick, clear, and smooth. Um, so we again investigate the probability distributions. This new map now shows the number of gamma ray bursts needed for a certain probability of value if the errors are divided by two. And so now we can observe a closed contour at around 2,250 GRBs. Again, however, if we're only interested in the supernova limit of 0 0.022, we instead use the following plot. And this shows that in the case that we divide the likelihood errors by two, we only need a sample of 1300 GRBs to use them as standalone candles. And so where does this minimum number lead us? So given this predicted number of necessary gamma ray bursts to accurately constrain our omega parameter, we look forward to the X-ray observatory missions that will supply us these gamma ray bursts. And so this slide here lists some of the current or proposed survey missions that will be observing gamma ray bursts in future years. And given the sheer detection power of SWAM and Theseus in particular, we expect to arrive at the necessary number of gamma ray bursts in only a handful of years after their launches. Um, so to conclude, uh, it should be highlighted that not only does the addition of gamma ray bursts and BAO and supernova data constrain omega well, um, but the specific use of the trimmed platinum sample allows us to arrive at our lowest error on the value yet. And not only this, but we find that the optical sample has just as much potential to be used in these ways as well. So furthermore, um, as the cosmological community continues to unravel uh, GRB progenitor physics, we will be able to better define GRB classes and then samples and thus continue to decrease these air bars. And then finally, we see through simulations and the probability maps generated that we do arrive at a minimum number of real gamma ray bursts needed based on the quality of the sample. And we stay tuned for these to be collected by deep space surveys in coming years. So uh, with that, 
I want to say thank you, and I'm open to answering any questions if uh, you have any. Okay, thank you, Via, for uh, the very nice presentation. And uh, now it's uh, time for question. So are there any questions from, uh, from the audience so far? Okay, if not, I would like to uh, uh, point out that uh, uh, the number of, uh, of supernovae that supernova 1A that have been used uh, for uh, like the so-called golden sample is also trimmed compared to the full sample of, of supernovae. So uh, Via, can you, can you comment a little bit more on that, please? Sure, on um, the trimmed platinum sample, yes. It, it is the, go... trim, the trimmed sample of the supernova 1A because we are not using the total sample of the supernova 1A, even when we consider the Pantheon sample that it is a collection of 1,048 uh, supernovae. Correct. We see that the number of supernova that we actually use in conjunction with the BAO and GRB data is quite a small subset of the total number collected by um, all of the surveys since you know, the 90s. Um, we see that uh, hundreds even are trimmed from each specific survey. And so that means that it's, it's probably just as trimmed as our GRB samples. Okay, uh, our our GSB sample is is trimmed a bit a bit larger than that, but uh, but it is the same the same idea of trimming the sample so that we can use the same uh, uh, so that we can we can use the cleanest light curve to uh, tackle the uh, cosmological uh, studies. Are there uh, any any other questions? or uh, comments for, uh, for Via? Um, I have a curiosity if I can. Yes, of course, Piaggio, please. Yeah, yeah um, just for curiosity, did you test which could be the minimum number of uh, simulated GRBs in order to have closed contours for the cosmological parameters, uh, no matter if the central value is not 0 0.3 fully converged, but uh, which would be the, the minimum number of simulated GRBs to close the contours? Yes, that was, um, we, we did compute that value for a uh, number of errors divided by two and found that that was 2,250 uh, according to this map. Um, however, to observe closed contours at different um, division of errors, uh, this is still a work in progress. And so we are looking into dividing um, by both less and more, all the way up till 10, as was presented a little bit earlier. And so, yes, um, those results are still coming out. Okay, thank uh, okay. you. Okay, Bia, I think, uh, uh, I think Biagio was asking if you don't consider the error precision that we want to uh, get, but if you have like much larger error, what it is the minimum number of GRBs that we need to simulate? Sure. So, so yes. um, we see that this is this is the contour plot for di uh, division by two. But when we don't divide errors at all, um, we see that there are no cl closed contours yet from the simulations that we've been running. Um, OK, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question. So it's around 150. Uh, if you don't consider this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, basically uh, um, precision of the of the uh, supernova 1A that uh, that uh, we want to reach, and maybe Biagio, we can discuss this uh, uh, later on uh, in more detail. So thank you yes. again for uh, for the question. Okay, so let's move Thanks on to you. the uh, last speaker of the session, uh, who is Alexander Lennart, and he will tell us more about the. Uh, GRB fundamental plane for the platinum sample. Oh, okay. Let me share my screen. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Welcome. My name is Alexander Lennart. Today, I would like you. Uh, I would like to tell you about the results of a recently published paper about the fulfillment of the dynamic 3D relation by different classes of gamma ray bursts and, statisti and statistical differences between those samples. 
what was also a topic of the first presentation of the session by Professor Dainat. The GRB zoo. Gamma ray bursts can originate from very different progenitors. They can be the result of a star collapse or a merge of two neutron stars or the black hole and neutron star. The first way corresponds to the formation of long GRBs and the second one to short GRBs. Long GRBs are sometimes seen together with supernovae, while short GRBs are sometimes seen together with kilonovae. That separates our two first classes into two classes each. A, sample, a subsample of GRBs linked with supernovae with very clear supernova association is called supernova ABC. We can go further with classification and extract a class of X-ray flashes, which are GRBs with soft spectra and emission with fluence higher in X-ray band than gamma ray band. The next class is considered to be a set of ultra-long GRBs with very long prompt duration, over 1000 seconds. Finally, GRBs with internal plateau are objects with a not well visible plateau effects. All of those uh, classes can follow different physical mechanisms. Thus, it is important to separate them for analysis. We investigated how well those samples fulfill the Dynoti 3D relation, uh, which is visible here. Uh, which can be explained with the magnetar model. This relation connects the following parameters. Luminosity at the end of the plateau phase, Lx, uh, which is luminosity here. Uh, prompt luminosity, L peak. And the time of the end of the plateau phase, Tx, in the uh, rescaled um, rest frame. Uh, additionally, we search for statistical differences between those classes in the 3D parameter space. In an article published by Professor Dainotti in 2016, has been defined a sample of GRBs called the gold sample. This is uh, the subsample of long GRBs with good data coverage and flat plateau. It was defined to get, uh, today by one of the speakers. A uh, recently published paper pinpoints the subsample of gold GRBs with even more strict conditions, and that is the platinum sample. In this sample, the end of the plateau phase has to be well visible in the light group. When the duration of the, light, uh, of the plateau phase is shorter than 500 seconds, light curve cannot have any gaps uh, in data close after the end of the plateau. Moreover, our data cannot contain any bumps or flares. This sample was also to defined in, together, uh, in today's talk. Uh, we use the fundamental plane related to the gold sample as a reference point of our analysis. After calculation of the orthogonal distance to this plane for every GRB, we received the following results. Uh, there is practically no difference between gold, uh, long, platinum, and ultra-long GRBs, as visible in this plot and uh, with the calculated zeta scores, <clears throat> indicating that probably they follow the same physical mechanism. There is a small difference between those classes and uh, X-ray flashes, and a significant difference between gold GRBs and those related to supernova, short GRBs, and the GRBs related to the kilonova. Um, but those results are not bias-free because cosmological evolution and observational limits are affecting our data. In order to get reliable results, one has to correct the data for those effects. The task is to find a function of redshift, the g, which after applying to our data in the following way, uh, by dividing it, by, the uh, by dividing observed parameter, here we see an example on luminosity by this function, 
uh, which after applying to our data uh, will remove bias. Summarizing, we are looking for a function which will remove correlation between the investigated parameter and the redshift, which makes the Kendall Tau parameter perfect for this purpose. According to its definition, we are looking for the value of this parameter as close to zero as possible. First time in the literature, this method was proposed by Efron and Petrosen in 1992. And our algorithm works in the following way. Uh, first, uh, we are looking for the luminosity of uh, some GRB at very low redshift, because uh, at very low redshift, uh, cosmological evolution should be uh, negligible. Uh, thus, um, <clears throat> our uh, function, uh, a reference function of evolution, uh, will be this luminosity at very low redshift uh, multiplied by the function uh, g. Uh, I'm sorry, divide. And uh, then we are um, using this function uh, as uh, here is plotted an example of this function uh, to calculate uh, for given value of k the tau parameter and we are doing it for the multiple values of k and this way we search for the tau uh, equal to zero <clears throat> um, by this correction the difference between classes of gold grbs and those related to the supernova became even clearer uh, we see here that uh, the zeta score is much higher, <clears throat> which indicates possible difference of physical mechanisms of long GRBs and the GRBs related to the supernova. It is important to pinpoint that there were found long GRBs for which we should observe supernova, but none has been found. The differences between the rest of classes and gold sample are very similar in both cases with and without correction for evolution. Surprisingly, after the correction, the difference between GRBs related to kilonova and short GRBs became much more significant. All kilonova related GRBs fall under the fundamental plane fitted to the short GRBs. Uh, here we see the histograms of distance to the short plane. Uh, this is after the correction for evolution, we see here that all kilonova are below the plane, while in case without the correction, they are more or less evenly distributed. There is also visible here, kilonova are represented with yellow balls, while short uh, kilonova less GRBs are represented with red cuboids. Uh, it is well visible here that uh, those kilonova fall under the, uh, the plane. Uh, also, it's worth to mention that kilonova are less luminous. Um, how well different classes are fitted to the dynotic 3 d relation? After the correction for evolution, parameters of the fitting of the dynotic 3 d relation to the kilonova data agree in one sigma with the incorrect ones. Moreover, sigma intrinsic scatter is very low in both cases. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, our parameters A, B, C, uh, which are parameters uh, in the dynotic 3D relation, uh, agree in, uh, within uh, error bars in one sigma with each other in cases with and without evolution. The next sample of GRBs related to supernova ABC also has compatible parameters in those both cases. It is worth to uh, mentioning that in case with correction for evolution, fitted relation has even smaller mean value of sigma than without. 
the last sample yielding such small sigma is the platinum sample, which also has parameters compatible in both cases. However, this sample is much bigger from the previous two. It has 50 GRBs, while we had only 8 kilonova and about 22 supernova. <clears throat> um, uh, moreover, it has a much smaller value of sigma, uh, of mean value of sigma, uh, in case with correction for evolution than without. Uh, this indicates that the platinum sample has potential to become a new standard candle set. At this moment, Professor Dainotti is working together with Luke Nearfoot on the reconstruction of light curves with machine learning, which can possibly extend our sample. <clears throat> our results indicate that it is really important to uh, consider the bias uh, given by the cosmological evolution, uh, because uh, if elimination of the results can lead to very interesting results. Thank you for your attention, and I would like to invite you to read the entire article. Thank you very much, Alexander, for your very nice talk. Now we, are, we have time for questions. So let's see if there are hands up. Uh, okay, if not, then I would like to ask you um, some, uh, uh, what are the next step that you are planning for, uh, for continuing on this uh, research endeavor? If you can tell us a little bit more about the, uh, how this will be related to the, uh, study of the Lorentz gamma factor that we initiated uh, some, some time ago. If you can just uh, uh, mm -hmm. comment briefly on that. Of course. Um, so as we know, gamma ray bursts are uh, highly relativistic uh, core, uh, events that are uh, not isotropic. In fact, they are collimated. Uh, they have they uh, emit a jet like structure. Um, <clears throat> what uh, makes uh, it different for us to calculate the exact uh, energy, uh, overall energy emitted by them? Uh, so uh, it is important to investigate in the near future. Uh, how this jet opening angle is affecting our data. And this jet uh, opening angle uh, is uh, related to the gamma Lorentz uh, factor, but also the modeling of gamma ray bursts uh, uh, suspects that when GRBs are in different environments, their properties can be different. And those environments are also linked to the Lorentz gamma factor. Uh, in fact, there was already pinpointed a sample of GRBs uh, in the study by uh, Srini Sharagavan in 2020, uh, when uh, uh, there was discovered a sample of GRBs belonging to one particular environment with very low uh, sigma scatter. It was uh, similar to the one obtained uh, here in this article. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for uh, this uh, uh, answering the question. And uh, do we have other, uh, other question or comments? Okay, so I just want to comment on the on the reconstruction of the GRB light curve. So basically, and this is connected with the, what Via has been presenting for the GRB cosmology and the whole analysis for uh, approaching the standard candle. So uh, the idea behind all the work is that we wanted to reduce as much as possible the intrinsic scatter. And in doing that, for doing that, we need to uh, tackle this uh, issue 
uh, under uh, with uh, uh, having in mind several uh, several issues. So the morphology of the light curve, uh, the different uh, uh, physical mechanism of different population of GHBs, and some uh, uh, observational challenges, as it is uh, the title of of the of this session. Uh, the observational challenges, uh, the theoretical limitations. So having uh, in mind all of this. Uh, the work that we are trying to push at this moment is to increase as much as possible uh, the uh, light curve analysis. So we have seen the talk of, uh, of some and, uh, and this GRB light curve reconstruction will allow basically to increase the sample twice. So this will be important also for, uh, for cosmology and for repeating the same, uh, the same analysis with a sample that is doubled. So to check if the intrinsic scatter will be reduced and how much we can learn more about the physics of, uh, of this uh, different population of, uh, of gamma ray burst. So that was a general comment of the, of the several talks that you have uh, heard in the second part of the, of the session. Okay, I'll just want to see if there are other questions or comments. Okay, if not, I would like to thank all the speakers of this second session and also of the speaker of all today uh, session. And I would like to invite you to join at the same time tomorrow at 6.30, 9.30 Central European time for the second part of, the, uh, of this uh, uh, GRB session. Thank you again all for participating. Bye.